It's coming, you... Well, another edition of Old School, alongside me, Dr. Tom Pritchard, um, veteran of the wrestling game, as, as everybody that comes on the Old School, and I like to tell everybody, anybody that's watched the Old School series, like I, I like to explain it, it's two wrestlers bullshitting. Um, you know, have fun and, and talk about things, and I like to talk about things like me growing up as a fan, and like uh, little influences, and little like parts of like my life that are intertwined with yours, but you might not even know. Um, uh, I'd like to start off with, you know, when did you become a wrestling fan? Well, ever since I can remember, I was a wrestling fan. I mean, since four years old. And, and the thing about this, Steve, is you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, about how many wrestlers were fans prior to becoming wrestlers, like Harley Race, especially yep. if you read about Harley's story, uh, and which is very, very interesting to me because I'm, I'm a big admirer of Harley's. And, and I, I just remember this was the only thing I ever wanted to do. So wrestling since the time I guess I was four years old, and, and that's it, man. I mean, I, there was nothing else. Was it something, like, when the first time you watched wrestling, is that, like, was there something that said, uh, that's what I want to be? You or know, did, it, did it take time to... No, that, I, I remember the first time I saw it, this was my first recollection, because um, I don't want to ask you on camera, but I will anyway. How old are you? 40. Okay, so 40 years yeah. old. All right, well, I'm 54. So, uh, actually... I started watching wrestling in the 60s when you had the black and white channel, mm -hmm. black and white TVs, and you had to turn the channel manually. And I remember the first time I ever saw wrestling on TV, my brothers were watching it, and I saw four guys in the ring doing a double crisscross. So doing this and this and this. And I sat down and watched it, and then I saw an interview with Dory Funk Sr. Mm -hmm. Not Junior, Sr. Now, you, you grew up in El Paso. Correct. Right? Well, yeah, okay, I was so born, born in El Paso, yeah. and then in 1969 is when we moved to Houston. Okay. But, but my first experience was in in El Paso watching West Texas wrestling. Right, which was I, the Amarillo territory, correct. right? Yes, where the Funks uh, ran things. And, and it just it, it intrigued me in this small studio and these guys doing this crazy stuff, and I sat there and watched it. I, I remember coming back, and Dory Funk Sr. did an interview, and then these bald-headed German guys with, with their manager in this black suit and a cane came out and did another interview, and then they beat up somebody else, and then these two masked guys came out with their manager. It was just something that was, uh, again, even in black and white, man, mm -hmm. it just, I, I was intrigued. By it. And everybody told me it was fake. My brother said, oh, man, it's just fake. We're just watching because nothing else is on. And uh, then I started just watching every Saturday, man. It was right after Roller Derby. You ever seen Roller yeah. Derby? Yeah, wow. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I just can't remember ever wanting to do anything else. I just saw that, and I said, that just right there is so cool. It's like running away with the circus. It, and it, it's almost like you're calling. I like, you know, people have always asked me, like, oh, how did you know you, you wanted to be a wrestler? And I, I, I can tell, like, the first time we had just gotten cable and um, Tommy Rich. The, I grew up right. in Philadelphia. So here's Georgia Championship Wrestling for the first time, and Tommy Rich is shooting a promo, and I'm like, Wow, and it was at the end of the show, and then later on that day, we had uh, Spectrum Wrestling on, on uh, Philadelphia Station, and it was Mr. Fuji and Saito against Martel and Guerrero, or uh, Martel and Guerrilla. And right then, I was like, I'm, I wanted, this is what I want to be at eight years old. And I can't tell you how many wrestlers tell me, like, that defining moment that they start watching and they know. That, that be a wrestler. Yeah, that, that's the interesting part. And I think I really do believe this. I've always believed this, and I've told kids this, and I've trained them too. I believe that you have to have been a fan at one time or another. And at least one time or another, I think you would have had to believe that this is real. Yeah. And you, to, to understand the feeling, because when you watch the guy like, let's say, Harley Race or the Funks or even Dusty Rhodes, even with his showmanship and his magnetism and his charisma, Dusty Rhodes understood that this is what he is. Yeah. He's, he's not Virgil Reynolds. He is right. the American dream. Uh, Dick Murdoch, guys like that that I saw, they believed what they were doing, and they believed when they saw what they were doing. I mean, and, and I'll take a guy, for instance, uh, Jake Roberts, who grew up with his dad kayfabing him on things. Right. You know, I mean... Living with that and then growing up and then being smartened up afterwards, 
just the mind game alone can make you. I look a little deeper into Jake's psyche, and I, and I have before mm-hmm. in this. It, it makes you who you are, and and it's the greatest personas. I hate the word character, but at the same time, character yeah. are the ones who are an extension of themselves. And again, I, I can remember uh, sitting with you as a kid in a bar, yeah. and we're sitting there, uh, and you were driving us around that weekend. Um, it wasn't for Jim Kettner, was it? Uh, Jim Kettner and um, Blaine DeSantis. Blaine DeSantis, yeah. yes, yes, of course. In, Reading, in, Pennsylvania, 1995. But you were driving a milk truck, I believe. Yeah, basically yeah. a milk truck, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, of course, and I totally understand that, man, because I I was a skinny kid, mm-hmm. you're too small, you'll never yeah. make it, man, this is just for big guys. That, and I was I was 170 pounds at the time, yeah. Exactly, so and it, I've on. heard the whole story for, yeah. you know, my whole life, but the problem was, you know, I... I knew I was going to get into wrestling one way or another, but I, I kept, I had this self-conscious thing in the back of my head that, you know, you're too small to make it, you know, you'll never be a, uh, you'll never really uh, be anything big in the business. My, my goal was just to be a wrestler. I wasn't right. going to be the world champion. I wasn't going to be anything else, but I surpassed <laughs> the things that I thought I would. I never in a million years thought I'd wrestle Madison Square Garden. Yeah. But of course it did. And once again, when I'm sitting there talking to you that night, I'm listening and watching the same thing, the same thing as I used to do when I would take Abdullah the Butcher and Rocky Johnson and these guys out after the matches to eat and then have them catch a plane. And, mm-hmm. and you're doing, doing the same thing and you're just, you're wanting it so bad. I think I told you don't buy any more drinks for us because you're wanting to buy drinks. And I said, stop. Because That's listen, you're not news. making the money. We weren't making a whole lot of money. Right. But you're doing us a favor less yeah. take care of you right now and I understand that passion and I believe anybody who really wants to do this anybody who ever was any good at it uh, and who was especially a success you can say all day long uh, that uh, Triple H is a businessman and he is but Triple H is a fan yeah and, right and, he and, grew up a fan he right? grew up a fan and he, and he understood the passion that you have to have and uh, I had that passion from day one that I saw these guys they were my Superheroes. They and, were the guys that I wanted to be like. And Amarillo was a, a tough man territory. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's Am- yeah. Amarillo was a territory again where they did things that were they wouldn't smarten anybody else up on. For instance, they had Terry Funk actually be arrested on TV without smarting up the cop. He threw a brick through the Inferno's car, and they tried to get it on TV without smartening up the, the camera crew. This is in the 60s now. They're trying to kayfabe. Right. Everybody. They're Now, they're trying to kayfabe the, the camera guys, yes. too. But they asked, they said, how far can you get a shot, just out of curiosity, the camera going out this door? Because they were doing an angle where uh, the Inferno's did something, and, and they ran out the door. Terry, this was a spur-of-the-moment thing. You can ask Terry about it if you ever get the chance. Uh, spur of the moment thing, he took a rock or a brick and threw it at J.C. Dyke's new Cadillac, and they didn't expect it, but it hit the car. The police were called, and uh, as Terry's doing an interview, the cop is actually trying to direct him off camera, and Terry says, can you come in here a little closer, sir? <laughs> and, and they got the cop <laughs> on camera. Man, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they got the cop on camera to actually do the arrest and it was a shoot yeah as far as you know the cops were concerned right and they would do things like this and and um in amarillo and and the funks looking back on it they did things that that you would think how can you get away with that well it's because it was a different time a different era and you had to that they protected the business they would do hard ways they would do things that uh you know, this may hurt a little bit, or it may hurt a lot, but we'll take care of you, type things. And uh, I know you've heard the famous story of the five-hour Texas death match with yes. Mark Funk Sr. and Ted DiBiase. Yep. Or, or uh, pardon me, Mike, Mike DiBiase. DiBiase. Yeah, thank you. And they had this whole thing where the town was in on it. And not the town was in on it, but the town was into it. Mm-hmm. And it's that kind of stuff that they did in El Paso. Uh, they did it in Houston, too. Um, but uh, I, and I can get into this a little bit yep. later how I got smartened up to the business in, well, yeah. inadvertently uh, by seeing the same angle happen in El Paso as it did in Houston, Houston. just with different people. Yeah. Now you had moved to Houston when you were ten, uh, about to be ten. So in the summer of '69, I, and the reason I remember that part uh, is because I saw the first man walk on the moon. Oh, okay. Or or so they say. 
And we're not sure if he actually walked on the moon or not. There's been conspiracy theories out there. And I see that cameraman right there. He's the biggest conspiracy theorist of them all. Is that true? It is true. He, he can't deny it. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, great. There you go. But yes. We, no we one can move. see him. And he hides behind the camera and gives you a yeah. little bit. He's one of those guys that hide behind the camera. But uh, I know. I see right here. Just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I'm making a so, point to no, realize no, who's yeah. filming, man. Um, so you moved to Houston when you're when you're almost ten. Now that's Houston wrestling, Paul Bosch. Now, how, what's the difference? You know, as a fan, ten year old fan, what's the difference that you see in Houston wrestling as opposed to Amarillo? Well, let me let me explain. First of all, in February of 1969, Dory Funk Jr. wins the World Heavyweight Championship yes. from Gene Kaninsky in Tampa, Florida, and. They've been wrestling in the main event in El Paso, Texas every Monday night. We weren't going to the matches. We, we, my dad didn't really have a, a great job. We didn't have a whole lot of money, but uh, he got a better job, and that's why we moved to Houston. Okay. Now, the Funks were the heroes. The Funks were who I followed. They were my idols. My, they were my guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now we have to leave. Now, February, March, April, May. So it, it, he'd have the title for a little bit, but... Now I've got to leave, and oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I don't know what's going on in Houston. Anyway, now, were you aware that there, were you a magazine guy? Like, were you aware that of the other territories? Well, I was, but really the only magazine at the time that I had seen, I didn't really know about the magazines until my brother took me to the Seven Eleven and we found a wrestling review magazine. Mm, right. Okay, that that was the first magazine I remember, and uh, but I wasn't quite sure what happened in Houston, mm -hmm. so. I was just upset that we had to leave El Paso because all these things were happening. And, and before we left El Paso, um, Grizzly Smith had come in the territory, real quick to set this up, and uh, he had the cast iron stomach where you could hit him, do anything you wanted to his stomach, and you couldn't hurt him. And this new guy came to the territory by the name of Handsome Harley Race. Mm -hmm. and, uh, at one point, Grizzly said, "I don't care if you get a 15-foot ladder and come off my, come off on my stomach. You can't hurt me." Well, the very next week, Harley came out and says, "Hey, I've got my ladder. Where are you, you coward? Come out here!" Well, of course, the next segment or two, Grizz came out. Harley set up the ladder in this small studio in the television lights, and he has two guys holding the ladder to steady him and. And Harley's up there ready, and Grizz is laying there prone. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that no-good son of a bitch comes off with a knee right across his neck. Right. And Nick Roberts, and I'll never forget this, uh, and it uh, leads into another story, but I'll get no, to this. No, I love the story. That's well, okay. But uh, Nick Roberts says, you know, Harley comes across Grizz's neck, and, and Grizz has his tongue hanging out, uh, and it's really dramatic. And Nick Roberts says, ladies and gentlemen, we need an ambulance. Not an ambulance, but we need an ambulance. Grizzly Smith is terribly injured. He, my God, what happened? And Harley says those guys wouldn't hold the letter steady. steady and oh, he's playing off of course, like he didn't no, I, I couldn't help it. It, it. it slipped. And we need an ambulance. And I think just a couple weeks ago, I spoke to your friend of mine, the American Dream, and he says, did you hear my shout out to you? He says, no, what? He goes, he said, I said, don't put me in the ambulance. Don't put me in the ambulance. I did it for you. Anyway, so, so thank you, Dream. Uh, so anyway, they put Grizz in, and now Doubt is, is, is covering Grizzly Smith's yeah. career. I've got to leave and go to Houston next week. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, we have a friend of my mom's who's going to cut out the newspaper clippings at the time when they had the mm -hmm. cards and results and send them to Houston uh, so I would keep up with what's going on each week. Right. All right. In the meantime, we move. And uh, we, we'd search around, and they had UFH mm -hmm, yeah, at yeah. the time. Of course, Same you do remember, yeah. of course. You're I'm 40, yeah. Yes, you are. My God. Anyway, uh, the point is, you know, we're, we're getting the results, and I find this, this new wrestling called Houston Wrestling with Paul Bosch, and Gary Hart was there as a yeah. wrestler at the time. Uh, the Spoiler, and a guy by the name of the Moon Man, and, and, and Johnny Valentine, Wahoo McDaniel. I mean, some really good wrestlers. I'm watching this on TV, and it's it's on Saturday night and Sunday morning on a UHF station. Sometimes you got, sometimes it wouldn't come. Was in it so the long. same show, a replay, or was well, it, it was a different? replay? Okay. No, it was a replay. It was an hour show, uh, which later got to be 90 minutes. But um, I started finding out about these other wrestlers, and Fritz von Erich, and. Uh, Again, Wahoo and Johnny Valentine, Fritz von Erich, they were the main guys at that time. And as I'm getting the results back from El Paso, from this lady, Mrs. Ryan, used to send them uh, 
to us, to me and my brother. Um, we found out that the matches were on Friday nights. They had reasonable prices. We didn't get to go a lot then, but we went a couple times. And, and I'm in Houston about three weeks, and uh, there's an article in the paper about Grizzly Smith uh, might be able to make his return shortly. Uh, but the doctors still aren't sure because of what happened with Johnny Valentine coming off the second rope with his atomic elbow <laughs> on his neck. And I thought, wait a minute, hold on here. Because uh, right before I left to go to El Paso, Harley Race came off a 15-foot ladder across his neck. And that's when it started to turn, and I found out this was happening in El Paso, this was happening in Houston. And once I got in the business, started working in Louisiana, I told Grizz about this. I also told Harley about it. And he says, oh, yeah, I was going to Japan for like six weeks, and I needed the angle. I was working out places. And that's wow. how I got him out. Now, at first, you think, wow, Grizzly Smith's the most unlucky guy in the entire world. Well, actually, no, I was just, I was, yeah, I was more intrigued. intrigued. Of course, no, I was intrigued. And it was like everybody had told me it, it was, they didn't use the word work. They said it was fake. Yeah. And as you know and I know, it's not, there's yeah. not fake. We may be predetermined, but the word fake doesn't yeah. enter into it. Uh, unless you have a really bad independent card. And I'm looking at you behind the camera. Don't eyeball me like that either, man, because I swear <laughs> to God. Anyway, uh, but the thing is, I, I became more interested in if this is how it works, then how does it work? I want to find out. Right. I want to understand. Because these guys were, uh, Johnny Valentine and Wahoo, I could see uh, watching on TV after a while when it was obvious my dad had a better job mm -hmm. and the tickets were more reasonable. My mom uh, took my brother and I to the matches every Friday and we were, we were able to go there was no school on Sunday Saturday right. so we were cool and I could see even from the uh, cheap seats that we had the sweat flying off these guys the marks on their bodies and uh, you know there was no way that this was phony right there was no I mean this was as real as it got and if you've ever had the chance to see Johnny Valentine live which I did I mean, I, yeah, it, I never got the chance. Well, but, I mean, know, it, just even watching them on video, right? It it, it was very watching on on YouTube, and even there's hard there's hardly any matches. There's one match I found with him and Wahoo, and uh, one with Sonny King, I believe. But watching a guy like Johnny Valentine, who a lot of the trainers uh, worth their salt, mm -hmm. who, or you can't, it's not your fault you were born when you were born or how old you are. So that you can't be faulted for that, but. Uh, and every generation has it. You say, this guy was the best, that guy was the mm -hmm. best. Well, Wahoo and Johnny Valentine, I got to see from afar. And then later on, I got to see up close. And I'll never forget the physicality because it was so real. And I thought, yes, I know there's something else going on here. But the realism, just the punching, the, the kicks... They were in a safe place. The timing. Yeah. The timing. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It's something you can't teach. It was instinctive, and uh, both guys had it. And anybody Johnny Valentine worked with, um, you saw the welts immediately. I mean, it was just so incredibly real. And I said, "How can you say this is fake?" Right. But but we had we saw great workers, right. and uh, I saw great workers growing up, and that's what just intrigued me even more: is how does it work? If it's supposed to be not real. It, it sure looks pretty damn real to me. Now, your, your brother Bruce, yeah. uh, is he older than you or young? No, he's younger. He's okay. Younger. Yeah. Now, does he get into wrestling around the same time as you? Yeah. Or, okay. No, he, he loved it too. Now, you know, it, yeah, he takes a different path in wrestling and stuff like that. But in the beginning, did he think he was going to be a wrestler too? Yeah, uh, Bruce uh, actually, again, he played played football. He, mm -hmm. had, uh, he hurt his knees, he had bad knees. And uh, he, of course, of course, he wanted to be a wrestler. Yeah. I mean, we. You know, I, I think we all do. I think we all have that performer in us that we yeah. want to do and want to be part of it. Um, and he worked at the office as well. I, I worked, I was, again, had so many fortunate breaks, but Bruce um, worked in the office. And once he understood that maybe he wasn't going to be able to wrestle because of his knees, he's got the gift of gab. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't mind the political landscape. Uh, he's a much better politician than I love him. <laughs> um, and uh, he, he was very good at doing what he did. Yeah. He, he was very good. And uh, he wanted to do it the same way. Once I got in and started wrestling and I found out the other side of the business, the dark side, so to speak, that uh, I'm not talking about the drug sex and rock and roll. I'm talking about the back Politics and yeah, how, how it all works. And how it all works. Um, you know, it wasn't really something that I would want 
uh, someone I love yeah. uh, to, to get involved in just so I don't want him to be hurt, I understand. But uh, at the same time, he was also a lot smarter than I'll ever be uh, in learning how to play the game. And that's what you have to do. Now, I understand Colby Russell's, and I understand, I'm, I'm sure you're very proud of him, too. You just don't want him hurt. And that's, oh, that's yeah, because so many, so many times you, you, you've, yeah. you've seen it and stuff. Now, yeah. who, who breaks into wrestling first? You or, you or Bruce? Or do you break in at the same no, time? No, well, I was, I was actually uh, older, so I had the opportunity first. Okay. I, because I, I, was, I, I was able, I started taking pictures for wrestling magazines when I was 12. Okay, so this is how you start with the, the pictures. Yes, yes. I started writing for magazines, uh, Norm Keitzer and Jim Melby. Mm -hmm. uh, again, with Wrestling Review, Wrestling News, Wrestling mm -hmm. Monthly, all these other things. And they sent me a press pass, a press card. And my brother, Ken. So you're a 12-year-old? With a press pass. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was cool, man. Yeah. It was very cool. But my, it was my, it was my older brother Ken, who, who I really have to give the credit to. He used to get us tickets uh, when he could. He worked at the newspaper in El Paso. And Gordy Guerrero would give him free tickets. Just uh, I think we went maybe three times. It was on a Monday night, and we had to go to school the next day. But Ken actually called Paul Bosch because he knew that I wanted to take. Be at ringside, take these pictures. I had this press pass, and Ken set up a meeting with Paul Bosch. Right. He picked me up after school, took me downtown to the office, which is a man you would go nuts because it was a museum. It was, oh. just a, it was a wrestling fan's dream. Yeah. And Paul was a wrestling fan, and Paul was broke in by Jack Pfeffer, if you know anything yep, about Jack, Jack Pfeffer. Pfeffer. Okay, wow. well, uh, so looking back on all that, I can see why Paul was the way he was, but, but it was my brother Ken who actually uh, got me my first meeting and got me in there, and I talked to Paul. Um, and the first match I, I photographed was, it was supposed to be Briscoe versus, Jack Briscoe versus uh, Dory Funk, I believe. And I think that was when, it, it wound up being Briscoe versus Wahoo, but I think it was supposed was to be it, someone else. Was it supposed to be, was that the night? Um, Not was when Dory got hurt, no. Oh, okay, okay, that's a, this is a different that's time. what I was though. speculating. Yeah, no, but, but I, yeah, I can get into that too. Uh, but. There was a different time when uh, it was supposed to be Briscoe versus somebody, or Wahoo versus somebody else. So whatever it was, it was a substitution. It wound up being Wahoo versus Jack Briscoe. Mm -hmm. And I took the pictures, and back then they wanted black and white. Right. Because that was... What the Easier for the did. magazine. Sure. And uh, I was at ringside. You had to have special permission. And I was down at 12 years old. And now I'm, I'm right there at the ring. Yeah. And again, Jack Briscoe and Wahoo McDaniel... And talk about physical, because yeah. Wahoo just beat the living hell out of Briscoe, and Briscoe beat him back. Yeah. And I took the pictures and, again, showed them to Paul, and uh, he gave me critiques. I sent them in. They got published. They got actually published in a Japanese magazine. Oh, and, nice. Yeah. Uh, I have a picture somewhere of Briscoe wearing the old NWA belt. With the red? Or no, with no, no, the, no. The one, the one that Harley beat yeah. Dory for. Now, that's because they had to... This is when they were renewing the belt, yep. taking the felt off and making it the better, better serviceable as yeah. it goes. But, uh, and I can't find the negatives I'm looking for somewhere. It was published in uh, a Japanese magazine. It was published somewhere else as well. I don't remember if Wrestling Monthly. Anyway, yeah. but that's how I became, I started and I kept going back. Finally, uh, I would take pictures of just certain matches, mm -hmm. big matches to send in to Norm and Jim. And uh, eventually, we still had seats in general admission. Well, they had this thing called permanent reservations back then. And uh, my mom, you know, ringside was like 550. Yeah. Okay, so general admission was like 250 or something like that. But we finally got tickets which down at ringside, which were right in front of the interview stand behind the ringside seats. Mm -hmm. Rings here, ringside seats, interview stand. And we got some tickets right there. And it just so happened to be where the future Mrs. Bosch uh, was sitting. Oh, wow. Because Paul was married at the time, mm -hmm. but uh, he was uh, seeing Miss Valerie at this time. So Paul would stop. Uh, yeah. Who, who wasn't? Yeah, all right. So I was right. trying to put that one together in my mind. Yeah. All right. That's okay. But yeah. you know, it, was, it was okay. But Paul would stop occasionally to speak to Valerie. And well, my mom started talking to Valerie and this other lady named Peggy. And they became friends. So while I'm taking pictures, developing this relationship as well with Mr. Bosch on Friday nights and things of this sort, uh, I'm getting my pictures published. I'm showing him this is happening. 
At the same time, Gino Hernandez mm -hmm. is, uh, he was about three years older than I. He was, uh, they used to have seconds go to the ring. Mm -hmm. Like in Japan? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, well they had each, and you had a good guy, bad guy second, mm -hmm. take the jackets back. And you walk to the ring of the guy, be in the ring with the guy, you check the guy and all the other stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's real cool, man. But Gino was doing that. Tiger Conway did that before he mm -hmm. wrestled, too. So when, once Gino started wrestling, you know, I said, Mr. Bosch, if I'm, you know, I'll never forget this. I called him from high school. I called him during a five minute break going to class and just said, listen, I want, to, I want you to know if there is ever an opportunity to come up that uh, Tommy Fouché or Pat Hatch will happen to be off, I'd like to just put my name in the hat to be a second. And he said, I'll keep that in mind. So How old are you at this, at this I point? I was, uh, I believe, 16. 16, okay. Yeah, because I was driving. And um, so he said, I'll keep that in mind. Well, uh, I don't remember how long it was after that. He asked me one Friday night, he says, how would you like to work as a second next week? <sighs> how would you like to win the lottery? Yeah, well, right. of course. Of course, so I did. I was able to do that. They still kept me out of the dressing room. A that's what I was just about to ask. So no, you were right. out of the dressing room, so I you mean, don't I, know how this I did. I took the jackets back, and once I would, I would walk in, I would put it down. Nobody would really say anything, but they made sure I didn't stay too long. And I, did, and I didn't stay too yeah. long. I didn't want to be overstepping my bounds. Uh, but I did that a couple times, and then Paul was moving his office from 2022 San Jacinto at the corner of Gray mm -hmm. to 1919 Caroline at the corner of Pierce. And that's how Paul used to sell his office every week. He said that every week, every chance he got. Now, th that was like a prestige? Well, like, it was, um, it was, it was uh, he had an right. office here and then he's moving here. But he said the, the address over so many times, it was like repetitive that I, over 40 <laughs> years now, I, don't, I haven't forgotten. Uh, but he said, would you like to help me move next uh, Saturday? And well, of course I would. So myself, again, a young Gino Hernandez who was already wrestling, Tiger Conway, and a few other people were helping. So I'm helping this promoter now yeah. move all these artifacts and pictures to a bigger office, his own office, and it's so cool to help him set up. My brother Ken, who, who again has been a very big influence on my life, my older brother, um, got me a job selling shoes at Montgomery Wards. You ever sold shoes? I haven't. No, but you drove a milk truck. Yes. Just the same. Yeah. Okay. So I'm telling, this is after two weeks, I'm picking up our tickets. And I'm telling the two ladies, Ann Snow, I believe it was the lady and Miss Lee, about how bad I hate this job. And it's just miserable because selling shoes at Montgomery Wards isn't, isn't yeah. exactly what I want to be doing. Um, and as I'm telling the story, Paul walks out of his office. And he says, well, uh, you just got done telling a story that you'll have for the rest of your life, uh, but how would you like to work here? Now, this is during the summer. Now, this, couldn't have, this could never happen in a million years. But a summer job, working at the wrestling office. Right. Something you, you've left since you were four years old, now you're... Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, for 75 bucks a week, and the reason I know that and remember that is I just found a check. I remember uh, that I had copied when I'm going through storage mm -hmm. uh, last year uh, for 75 bucks uh, a week, and I made sure that I held on and put it back in my file cabinet. So now, well, yeah, I'll cut the grass, I'll run errands, I'll do anything at all. Yeah. And all I have to do is be at the wrestling office answering phones, selling tickets. And yeah, I mean, that's that was cool. So I started working there at 16, and this is where we get into every Friday morning or afternoon, Gary Hart would show up, uh, go over the matches that night with Paul. And it was Gary the Booker? Yes. Yeah. Gary was the Booker. And occasionally Gary would bring some of the guys to the office too, just show them because Paul had a magnificent yeah. museum of an office. Well, uh, there was a time where there was this football player, and I can't remember his name at all, but he wanted to be a wrestler. And uh, one Friday, uh, Gary brought the Iron Sheik with him, who was Mohammed Farouk at that time. Oh, wow. Yeah, so Mohammed, was Mohammed Farouk. Farouk, wrestling in Dallas Territory. And, uh, and he must have been pretty young at this time, too, was, out of Vern's camp, right? Yeah, well, yeah. he was he was uh, already had the mustache. Yeah. He was a uh, bald head. Uh, so I'm not quite sure in 1976 how old he would be, but right. well, we can look. I mean, uh, I just remember Paul telling me, you can go down with him 
not a problem if you like. This is to the Sam Houston Coliseum yeah. before anybody get there. So Gary got there about 11 o'clock uh, with the Sheik and uh, now I am taking the Sheik and the football player in my car to the Coliseum and we're getting in the back and I'm looking at it and now this is the first time I'm actually walking in the dressing room getting dressed to go get my ass kicked in the ring. But I didn't know, really know what to expect. I was going to say, did you know you were going to work out with these guys? Or I, I, like... I had my gear. Right. I had uh, gym gear with me. Yeah. Okay. But I didn't know exactly what to expect. I expected maybe he was going to rough me up, stretch, whatever. Now, did Paul know that you wanted to be a wrestler? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh so, God, yeah, yes. that, was, that was well out there that you were... You wanted to work in the office just so you can get a shot. To he knew. I told him, he dream. said, you're too small. You might want to think about college. Mm -hmm. you know, no, sir, I want to be a wrestler. Uh, in fact, he actually, I have Paul's last wrestling license. I have a picture of him. I'll show you later. He said to Tom Pritchard, this is my last wrestling license. Save it along with your first. Mm -hmm. So oh, nice. that was very cool, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but this first day, I remember the Iron Sheik is trying to show us how to lock up. And I slapped him in the ear, locking up. And you can imagine, the sheik said, I did not sit to go up, and slapped the living shit out of me, which is probably why I have hearing damage today, I don't know. But that was my introduction, and then he went over, we, didn't, we did some squats, we did some push-ups, I'm not quite sure, I don't remember the whole warm-up routine, I just remember after slapping him in the ear, he slapped the shit out of me, and then I remember the football player didn't know anything. The football player just thought it was going to be a phony day at the office. Yeah, and, thought it was uh, easy. Sure, it's all. And then Cosro said, uh, okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to get down all fours. You take me over. You take me down. Well, the football player went first. He couldn't do anything. Cosro turtles on him. And yeah. Then he says, now me. I went to do the same thing. Of course, I'm a I'm buck 50. Yeah. And skinny as hell. And... Uh, uh, I couldn't do it either. So Cosmo now says to me, he goes, okay, now I go. So he said, get down on all fours. And, of course, to this day, I don't know what hold he had me in. I just know he had my head up my ass to where he says, scream. I want to hear you scream. I said, okay, okay. I said, no, more, more. Scream, scream. I said, okay, okay. And then he finally pushed me off like that. And then he did the same thing. Did you scream? Oh, no. I said, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. was enough for me, man. I, that was screaming. And I was screaming. You're going to scream in a minute, man. I just want you to know that. Because <laughs> <sighs> you're going to say, what the hell? But it, anyway, the guy lasted two weeks, and he was done. Mm -hmm. But Kozler was there another, I think, two months and would come in every Friday with Gary, and I was able to go down to the ring with him. Uh, so once after that, Shiki Baby left the territory, yeah. and there, were, there was a wrestler named Nick Kozak and a former wrestler named Jerry or uh, Joe Mercer. They had a record service, and they had a ring set up in this old, dirty, filthy garage, which was their record service. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul said, with his blessing, you can go down there, because I asked Paul, do you mind if I go train with Nick and Joe? And he says, go right ahead. Because he was trying to discourage me. He wanted, right, me, right. He was, he wanted me to see the dirty part of it. He yeah. wanted me to see that it's not always uh, you know, the glitz, glamour, and the same Houston Coliseum, which is right. a pretty cool building at the time. So I went down there, and there was another guy in King Parsons. Wow, I spent King Parsons. Yeah, he used to drive his dump truck to training straight from work, man. He drove yeah. a dump truck, a huge dump truck. And he would come straight to training, bust his ass, and there, were, there was like four of the guys there. Um, Sammy Jones, uh, another guy, not the Gary Young, but another guy yeah. named Gary Young. And we would work out in this ring. I'll never forget. Uh, I think it was... Sammy or somebody hit me in a headlock and I'm overselling. And Nick says, don't do that. That's overselling. That's that's worse than not selling. Don't overdo it. And he tried to explain the psychology and tried to explain things. But again, being young. You now at this time now that you're training, you, you're starting to realize like, okay, this is this is a, this is kind of a show, you know. I'm, I'm not putting on as much pressure. You're getting smartened up. Of course. Slowly though, right? Slowly. Now are you getting sure. smartened up without getting smartened up that they're Baby There's, stepping it to you. Yes, and, and, there, and Paul's realizing this too, but Paul is also seeing how I'm reacting when I'm going with him, when he has to do in-studio interviews, when they're, they're not taping live, but the guys will come in and he, like for instance, uh, had Jimmy Snuka and uh, Bruiser Brody mm -hmm. had to do interviews. Well, Snuka's a baby face, Brody's a heel. We're at the studio, 
Uh, Paul still didn't smarten up the uh, director and cameraman too much, but he had to do it a little bit, obviously, because they're not stupid. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, he wanted to see how I reacted to if I was going to be that mark or if I was going to be that kid or if I was going to say anything, which I never did. Right. Uh, so I was surely, slowly but surely, just showing him that this is what I really want to do. I understand it's tough. I understand that. And going down to this record service where you're going to fall out and you're going to probably run into a tire or something on the ground. I mean, it could hurt you. Yeah. Um, but I didn't care. That's what I wanted to do. And uh, I'll never forget just training and training and training and still working at the office and being Paul's assistant at ringside mm -hmm. on Friday nights too, which meant I'm sitting next to him. And what we did back in the old days, he had the monitor here at the ring and we just had a cardboard, you know, what's up next, a commercial like Mr. Norman, you know, he pitched Mr. Norman. Uh, and that was it, or I'd tell him something from the director. I mean, yeah. so I was assistant director. Right. But I'm sitting there with Paul Bosch now at ringside, his assistant, and I'm watching these matches. And even when we weren't taping, I would go down on occasion and sit at the stairs and watch these, these matches because I wanted to see how it was done. I would occasionally watch the mouths. I would see if anybody could, if I could watch them talk or, or communicate or anything. And the greatest thing was, these guys were so pro, so pro, so professional. I guess uh, uh, I'll never forget Al Madrill telling me that he'd work with Nelson Royal. Mm -hmm. and Nelson would be talking to the referee, telling a spot at the same time, and you'd have to listen so close because he's like, "Ask him, referee, okay, attack will drop down. All right, tell him again, referee, come Almost on, get subliminal, it. right? Yeah." yeah. And yeah. you're going, oh, my God, man, now looking back on it. You know, I, and I, I try to do the same thing in my matches at times, but it's still, you have to think. And you know how the short-term memory gets. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so there we go. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but, but, I mean, I was watching great workers like that, and, and that's kind of how it evolved into uh, King Parsons having his first match in Dallas, mm -hmm. and they invited me to go along, Nick and King were going to drive. That very day, my girlfriend's mom has a heart attack. Oh, yeah, my mind, she calls me up crying, upset, and saying, Mom just had a heart attack. You go in the hospital now. I said, gee, I'm sorry to hear that because I'm going to Dallas. Yeah. We were not together anymore. Um, uh, but that's okay, man. I mean, mother, that's... Did the mother die? Yeah. Oh. Well, sorry to hear that. It was but, your first uh, heel turn. Yeah, I don't know. That wasn't my first. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm trying to yeah, say. When people yeah. talk about sacrifice and you do anything and, and uh, you know, whatever it takes, whatever, I'll do anything, but i got to go over here. Yeah. No, no, you don't understand. That's what a normal person wouldn't understand. They wouldn't No. Understand. No, you're right. That's what no. I'm saying. Nobody does. We justify it. We're like, hey, we get, you, we got to do it this way to get to this this part of our career. You have to. And we justify it, and people are like, I don't get it. No, but you don't get it because, see, this isn't, and I always said this, and right or wrong, mm -hmm. I mean, there's this and there's civilians. Yeah. And I don't want to be a civilian, and even though, no matter what we're doing, once you've done this, you've done this. Once you're in this, you're in this. It is, it is mafioso. It yeah. is what it is. This is what it is. You're not anything else but what you are. And if this is what you are, this is what you are. And I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. I'm just saying um, you're, either, you're either born to do it or you're not. Yeah. And, and the people, the, the, normal, the normal people that look at it as, oh, my God, how could you have done that? I mean, she was your girlfriend or mom had a heart attack. And it's like, yeah, but you don't understand. I loved this long before I loved her. Yeah. And the wrestling will always be there. She might find another guy. Yeah, yeah like I've did. justified stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's the way kind of happened. Now, before we get to Dallas, what's your first, imp uh, your first impression of that first bump? Did you, oh, the, my first, first bump. Yeah, when you took that first oh. bump in training, what, what, well, like, yeah. what was the feeling you had? First of all, I, I was I was taking judo and karate when I started at ten. Oh, I so actually, see, yeah, I, kicks I, was the yeah thing. kicks. Well, I was taking a little judo first too. We, had a judo karate, so I mean, I had already taken bumps, mm -hmm. and I wasn't. I was. I knew how to fall. I, I understood how to slap the mat. Yeah. Uh, so that really didn't bother me. Um, I mean, I was cool with that, and I was cool. Actually, it was getting the shit beat out of me because I expected it. Yeah. I wanted to go through the ritual. Yeah. I did, because I figured, you know, look, man. See, the first year I, I got a cauliflower ear when nobody gets cauliflower ears yeah. because Ron Starr and Johnny Mantel. Well, I love you guys, uh, but every night for a week would bend my ear back, 
put the headlock on stiff. Rub it, right? Rub it, yeah. and then they would put me in a head scissor. I'll never forget it because the first time they did it, it was in uh, Fresno. I know this because they said, oh, we have to lance it with the razor blade. Kid, I'm 20 years old. Yeah. Okay, no, what am I going to say? No? All right, guys, go ahead. And they do. The next night, we're in San Bernardino. Now it's tender. Is of course it is. Yeah. yeah, but I'm not going to put it over. Are you yeah. kidding me? Jesus, man. I mean, like, shit, I'm, I'm going to get the hell beat out of me. Then I'm going to show him I can take it. Yeah. The next night, San Bernardino. See, it is tender, and you do it again, and they do the same deal. And I know what they're doing, Yeah. but they want to see if I'm going to bitch. And you're smart enough to realize, okay, yeah, here it comes. You know, I'm just going to put up with it. I, yeah, because no matter what, they're not going to make me quit. Right. And they did. This is part of the game. It is. Yeah, yeah. It is. And again, a normal person saying you did what? Yeah. But that's what we did. And they wanted to last my year again in San Bernardino. And they did. By Monday night, I believe we were, we were in, uh, not Bakersfield, but uh, San Pedro, somewhere like that. And uh, they did it for the last time. They tried it again in the shower. This is three times in a row, okay? And, and nothing's happening. So finally, Dr. Bernard Schwartz. Do you remember Dr. Bernard no. Schwartz? From, okay, in L.A., that when, they, when John told us, you do remember, told us on the powder? Yeah, yeah. That was from Dr. Bernard Schwartz. Oh, okay. He was a ringside physician. Yeah. He was a mad scientist because you went into his office in uh, Watts. Are you familiar with Watts? In, in L.A.? Yes. Yeah, real bad oh, area. Real bad. And he had these stacked up files all over his office that was just and I'm not sure he had his office clean for 20 years before that and I showed him my ear and because it was getting pretty sore at that time and again you can see the yeah, the, it's, yeah and I kind of keep my hair long because it's almost embarrassing now because nobody has a cauliflower yeah. ear anymore or scars uh, right okay so uh, and the guy says well it's pretty much already calcified and there's nothing you can do about it Okay, can you give me something for the pain? Why, of course I can. So. <laughs> and there we go. Uh, you know, so, I mean. So that was the first gimmick doctor you used to use? Well, that? yes. Okay. So that was there's it. a lot along the lines, uh, right? That, but we won't. Yeah. No, no, we of course won't get names. Mm -mm. Uh, no, they're not on there. Federal right. witness protection. Right. Yeah. But, so, um, now, uh, Iceman King Parsons goes to Dallas for yes. his first match. You go along with. Yes. Now, th is this your first time seeing. What eventually becomes world class wrestling. It was just yes. championship wrestling at the time. This right? is this was the first time actually. Uh, I had already been a second. Mm -hmm. I had been Paul's assistant. Now I've been in the dressing rooms a little bit more, but I still haven't overstepped my welcome. Yeah. You know, I, I was in there when I was needed, but you know, when they were talking, they would still be over in the corner. It was a little more cafe. But when I walked in with Nick and Iceman uh, for the first time. Uh, Bronco Lubitsch came over to me and says, well, I didn't expect to see Paul Bosch here tonight. Yeah, just, just being funny. Yeah, he was, yeah. he was, Bronco was a very nice man, but he was being very, very nice. And it was very welcoming. First time in the Sportatorium, and I'm looking in, in there. It's, it's a very cool vibe in the dressing room. And so they had a crow's nest. Have, have you been to the Sportatorium? No, no. Okay. I just ever, yeah, I always saw the no, not sure. documentary. Okay, well, they, they had a, it was a very cool building. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you could go, they had a crow's nest for families and where the guys could watch where nobody would really mess with you. So I went to the crow's nest, watched Iceman, I think he worked with Akbar, which I worked with, I worked with Skinder Akbar my first day, my first time in the, in the sport of tournament yeah. as well. I think it's because Akbar knew, excuse me, and knew how to take care of guys and yeah. have a match with anybody. So uh, I went with them and uh, Nick worked that night as well, but I just watched. Hung out in the dressing rooms. Uh, it was the, it was like I expected it to be, but even better. Yeah. Because of camaraderie, and you could see the boys talking, and they weren't kayfaving me anymore. It was more like they'd seen me in Houston, but they weren't quite sure what my role was. But now they're seeing me with Nick and Iceman, and now they're seeing that, okay, maybe the kid's trying to pick it up. And David You're in Von the Eric, fraternity, right? right? I remember David Von Eric. Uh, and taking some dirt off the top of the door, rubbing it on him, 
and uh, it rubbing all over like this, and I, and I said, what the hell are they doing? And then and Bruiser Rhodey was there, and it was to appear as though they were fighting in the dressing room, so when they came out, they were already going, they were already going at it. Wow. Okay, so, see, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what explained to me later on. Because I'm watching David, and I'm, I'm, he's putting this stuff on him, and I'm going, what's going on? And then Nick explained, you know, yeah. this is the angle, this is what we're doing. So, and then later on, when I, when I did go to Dallas uh, for my first match, I flew southwest with Mark Lewin, mm -hmm. otherwise I would have drove. But we twenty-five dollar flight. Uh, wow. flew, to, flew with Mark Lewin to uh, to Dallas, and uh, this lady picked us up along with Bruiser Brody. And Mark and Brody are working that night. How you say lady like? You know, uh, I don't lady. mean rat, but I mean. Oh, okay, rat. okay. Yeah, just, Thank yeah. you. Okay, yeah. rat picked us up, and um, Mark was one of the guys who uh, introduced me to lifting and rolling your own and. Taking some of this, taking some of that, and you know, before we go to the gym, and I got some of the best workouts in the world. Right. Well, as we get off the plane, and this rat picks us up, and along with you know Brody, with Brody, they have this stuff already rolled. Now, uh, what am I going to say? No. <laughs> just say no. Yeah, just cheer up, right? Uh, I'm blasted by the time I get to the Sportatorium. <laughs> for your first match? Yeah, there. well, well, no, this, no, you've this been is there my first match in the Sportatorium. Okay. Uh, I've wrestled, I've had a couple matches prior to, um, which I can get to in a minute, but uh, just talking about Dallas here, <laughs> uh, I walk in the dressing room, and of course I'm with Mark, and we, we they had switched cars by this time because uh, Brody rode with us yeah. and another girl followed, but Brody had to had partake, as we all did. And... Um, so we got in the deal and everybody saw me walking with Mark and of course it was natural because of Von Eriks and it was that culture and it yeah. was Gary and Gary smoked and, and and Mark was a huge deal too like from you know the 50s on so like you know he yeah. really can't do any wrong you know well, he's, a, he's, no. a, he's a made guy well right? at the same time though see I didn't understand why Mark was just working um, Houston for a while see it, it took it took Mark from my understanding, and after learning about things in the business later on, uh, Mark had trouble working places later on because of things that he did early on. Oh, really? Okay. So uh, I was wondering because he was one of the big stars when TV came. You know, good-looking guy. Now, now the near the end, he's the purple haze and yes, in in Tampa. Yeah. And, uh, but while in Houston, he was just one for, for a time there. He was only working Houston. And he was living in an apartment off Telephone Road, which was not the greatest place in the world to live. Uh, but we used to go to the gym together. I would come pick him up. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand that he was only working that one Friday night a week. It took Gary Hart to get him back in the territory mm -hmm. because Mark had, a, I guess, a reputation uh, of being difficult at times or doing things his way when they wanted it done their way. Now, at this time, did you realize how the territories were? Was Houston a one-town territory? Well, Houston used guys from either Different the area. Dallas office or San Antonio. Right. But Houston was its own town because Paul would fly in his own main events if he wanted to. Yeah. And that got him a little heat later. I, I'm learning, I was learning all this later on about how Paul, because I thought Paul was a great man. He, and he is a great man. He was yeah. a great man. And uh, his book is a great book, but then, have you read his book? No, no. If, well, good. It, it, it's, it's a good book, but it's very you much... Get that high spot? Oh, well, you can get that. First. You can get it, I think, at Minute Man. It's, it's, it's a very hard book. He self-published it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just a, um, you know, it's very pro-Paul Bosch. And Paul, you know, I didn't realize was, I don't want to say he was egotistical, because he, 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 was, very, he was very proud of what he did. And, 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 and he should have been. And he was a good pay guy, right? That was his reputation, right? Well, one of the right? best. One of the best. Do you think that got him heat with other promoters? That he was um, a good pay guy? I, I knew it got him uh, a little bit of heat with Jim Barnett at one time, but Paul didn't care because Barnett said he was paying, I think, Tony Atlas too much. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they wanted to keep the boys in line at that time, okay? But at the same time, um, I think that... Uh, uh, Paul had his one town, he would fly in his main events, he would do what he wanted to do. At times he would want to switch title when Gary says, I can't do that. 
And Paul said, okay, fine. And he went ahead and did it anyway. So, yeah. so Gary just disregarded the title switch and, and took care of his What, he downs. would do like a title switch from like the Dallas office? To, yeah, you know, like he would want to switch the American, like American Championship. Side, yeah. yeah, the American Championship to, to somebody. And, and he said, I can't do that, Paul. He says, okay, yeah. we'll just do it here and we'll ignore explain. it the rest of the way. Yeah, and that's what they did. You well, know? he didn't create his own champion, right? Uh, Paul? Yeah. Well, he, 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 he always used someone else's? Is well, he would use the NWA champion. He did. No, no, no. He, he was affiliated with the NWA up until the time Harley, I guess, missed the shot, and then he, you know, That's Nick right. Bockwinkel was part owner of Houston. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you talked to Nick. About I, this. Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, he told me that story once. Yeah. And and I was, uh, I was so surprised. Yeah, he, he, he did. He worked twice that night, right? That Harley. Yeah. Didn't make it. Yes, he did. And uh, but that. It, the final straw, I think Harley didn't make it a couple times. I was there the first time in the summit when mm -hmm. Harley thought it was a night show and Harley showed up and I remember everybody panicking and uh, going crazy. But be that as it may, uh, Paul was his own town, but he used either Dallas guys for the rest of his card or he used San Antonio later on. But um, as the business was going on, you know, uh, Paul became promoter, I believe, in 64 after Morris Siegel died or 63 around that point. Might have been even 67, come to think of it, because it was shortly after we arrived. He had only been promoter uh, for a few years. Right. I remember reading that and hearing about that. So uh, he had been Morris Siegel's assistant prior to, after a <coughs> car wreck. So he knew the business. He had all this stuff going on. But um, it was one town. It was his major town. It was, uh, you know, there was the Dallas territory, the San Antonio territory, and they figured Houston was was its own town, like St. Louis. It's yes, so yeah, that's yeah, what I was going to say. Yeah. Now you get to, uh, you get to Dallas with Mark Lewin and you're, you're uh, happy. happy. Yeah, you're happy, good. No, uh, how, I, what are you thinking at this point where you, because you, you know, you're, you're, you're smoked up and you're meeting the David Von Erich and stuff like that. And you, do you realize like all these guys are doing it? Like it's just a, a way of life? Or? Well, this is, this is how I found out. I mean, when I was a teenager and uh, I was working out, this is the way I came to really know Mark Lewin. Mm -hmm. We were working out at uh, the World Class Spa somewhere in Houston one night and I see Mark. And he kind of looks at me and I kind of look at him and I go over and just say hello. And, oh, hey, how are you? What is your name again? And I, he's out of his mind. I say, Tom, goes, yeah, hey, why don't you train with me? And I said, great. Right, man. So we start training big. Together at that time, I'm big. Right? Yeah. He's huge, but I mean, I'm just trying to get huge. Well, he says, uh, "Cool. Can you pick me up at my place?" Well, yes, sir. I can. Yeah. Here's um, the address, Telephone Road. I'm thinking, Telephone Road. You're a big star. Why are you living in <laughs> Road? You know. Well, little did I know. Uh, as, as we show up, he had his father there. His name was Sid. They called him Blackie because he liked to get dark in the. the uh, Summertime, he loved keeping a tan. He was a he was an ex jeweler. Um, he he did other things, I'm sure as well. But Mark, shady jeweler. Yeah, I would never say that. <laughs> but uh, Mark um, says, "Would you like to have a smoke before we go?" Now, once again, what am I going to say? Yeah. Now, I really haven't been smoking. I, I mean, I really was. I was kind of like Cuban as a kid. I yeah. just wanted to be in the wrestling business. And if this is what it takes to be in the wrestling business, by God. I'll go ahead. So we, he already had it rolled, ready to go, and I hit it, and I did pretty good at it. I mean, I took to it pretty well. And after we finish, you know, I was and Sid at this time was eighty six. Okay. So that's what I'm with you guys. Hmm? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Sid smoking with us. And uh, now I'm realizing I'm high as, <laughs> as hell, and we're about to go to the gym to work out. And I'm wondering how this is going to go. Right. But um, it goes. And we're we're training. Training. We train like a son of a gun, man. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I recommend, I, listen, just say no, but training high wasn't bad. And it's but, every year or two, right? Yeah, well, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not anymore. But, uh, but if it's legal in your state, go of ahead. Of course, of course. And uh, But we did. So I started picking him up, and uh, it became, listen, try two of these and one of those. And then we got into the Diana Ball, which is archaic <laughs> at this time. Uh, Diana Ball, you know, try a couple of these and go to the doctor. And the doctor actually gave me a prescription 
for Diana Ball. Like, yeah, but at the time, it's not illegal, not illegal right? You're yeah, right. If, with a prescription, you could get it. Like doctors didn't realize. Like, well, and, and did I they was, know or at like, this time know? I was seventeen. Yeah, and you had to have parents' permission. So I forced my mom. I had actually had a girl at high school forced my mom's signature. Okay, now um, you got to think about all this stuff, man. That I'm trying to do to get big because I want to yeah. be a wrestler. And Mark is now giving me things to get bigger and 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 feel better and yeah. things like this. So finally, something the happened. Vices. So, was the that vi the vices? The vices, well, yeah. of course. And uh, I like that better. But, but we we eventually he. Couldn't have his membership at the World Spa, wherever the hell it was that we were working at, so we had to go to the YMCA. And now I'm picking him up, and I, again, I had these pictures of Mark and I outside that this lady took of us uh, one time. Anyway, it's, that's another story altogether, too. Uh, but we, I would t go to his apartment. It was a ritual now because we would literally smoke one to two Possibly three. Now this takes a good hour and a half sometimes. Yeah, you know what I'm saying because it's it's you're talking. What are we gonna do? We're gonna do legs. I got all this. And Mark is a very philosophical guy at times. Have you ever interviewed Mark? I haven't, but I've talked with him before. Yeah, because you've seen him now. He looks yes different. so different than he did. You yes. Know. Yes, and I should have talked to him more because when I worked with him in Houston in '87, I didn't know how to talk to him. I didn't know how to talk to anybody for the. WWF Paul Bosch show. That's mm -hmm. again. That's another story. Yeah, I, I definitely want to get to that. I don't know if I want to or not. But okay. anyway, the uh, thing is, no, we, whatever you want to talk about. The thing is, I was uh, partaking with Lewin, and I was, you know, again, it was Brody, it was Stefan Eriks, it was Gino, it was uh, Gary Hart. It was, a, it was the culture. Mm -hmm. It was what it was. I mean, if you didn't smoke, you said something's wrong with you. Yeah. And, and that was the deal, man. I mean, we just, and I thought everybody, nobody could tell I was high, man. Are you kidding me? Shoot. I was hiding it great. Wow. But, yeah. you know, everybody did. Everybody knew they were, if, if you weren't stoned, they, they looked at you like, man, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah, this guy's square. Yeah. 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 yeah, and they just, uh, they didn't want to work with you. So that's kind of my introduction. That that was how, so getting back to Dallas, when I'm blasted out of my mind, <laughs> Akbar can already pretty much tell, but he was such a great man. I mean, he, he knew... Um, uh, he knew who I was with, he understood, and he took great care of me. He was a nice man, and uh, you know, he beat me, <laughs> which was great, and, and had no problems doing that. Uh, but I just, I, I, I was intrigued that these guys were able to get in the ring and be high as shit and be able to do this because I was scared out of my mind. Right, you're paranoid at this point, yeah. right? Yeah, a young guy, like, oh shit, my first. My dad. I gotta tell you, the first TV that I went to uh, was in Louisiana, and I followed Boyd Pierce, mm -hmm. okay? After Friday, we drive to New Orleans, I think it was, or Shreveport, excuse me, for Watts TV. Um, well, Buck Rubley's a booker, and I work with uh, my second match ever. My first match was against El Satanico number two, because El Satanico number one had to babysit that night. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, oh, the devil. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my second match ever was against Lord Jonathan Boyd. Oh, yeah. sheep herder. Sure. And then I worked with uh, Michael Hayes and Terry Gordy at the same taping, right? Uh, and they gave me, a, they used to do a finisher with a backdrop into a, a power yeah. bomb or pile driver, yeah. whatever it was. I took that. Um, and yeah, because Gordy would catch you, right? Yes. And then yes. So you landed so somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And uh, wrestling too was there. Actually, had his mask on the whole time in the dressing room, and I'm watching this all this stuff happen. And I'm going, man, I drove all night, and I'm like, I really don't know what to do yet, and I'm really haven't smoked a lot of pot yet. But Buck Rubley comes in and says, uh, "Hey, kid, you want to work tonight?" Said, well, yes, sir. In front of all the dressing room, he stands up. And he says, uh, "You smoke pot?" Uh, yes, sir. He goes, "You'll be fine. You're right with me." And I just, oh God. Wait, so, imagine your career would have been different. Yeah. Do you think if you would have said no? No, I think it would. Yeah. yeah probably. So it's something that, one of those moments that like, the, I had. Of course, yes. Yeah. By, by God, yeah. Do you want to move along? If you didn't, you wouldn't have worked over with the booker and learned, right? Right. Yeah. But what I learned was uh, I, I, I went to the dog track with Buck that right after TV, parked my car at the Shady Oaks Hotel, wherever it was. Jake, if you fall asleep, I swear to God, I'm going to come over there and I'll wake you up. Check me out. <laughs> <laughs> but. But I rode with Buck, and again, uh, he uh, had everything rolled, everything ready. Now I'm riding with the Booker. Now we're getting a late start because 
something with his wife and his kid at that time. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, actually, I didn't. We didn't park my car at Shady, Shady Oaks. I parked it at the trailer park where he was at. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to stay at the Shady Oaks after with Gino. Gino said you could stay in my room. It's not a problem. Save you some money, kid. Uh, so we get up to a late start, but Buck is one after the other. Now we're going to in these arenas. I don't. Is remember. he driving or you? He's driving. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I could even say my name back then, but. But we get to these arenas in Louisiana where the toilet is literally in the middle of the floor, or the room, excuse me, middle of the room. No, no walls around it, anything. And, and it's just, there's just a wall between this room and that room. The heels are over there, the baby face is over here. But there's a little space that you can yell at each other, talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, and I'm working with Jonathan Boyd that night too. Well. We get there like five minutes before bell time, I guess. I'm on first. Get dressed, kid. I'm yeah. nervous as hell. I'm high as hell. And everybody knows because I rode with Buck. Everybody gets it. I understand. I'm working with John. I go out to the ring. We have a match. I come back. Oh, geez, that's over. It's great. Wonderful. So Jonathan rides back with us, as does Wrestling 2. So it's Buck, myself, John Boyd, and Wrestling 2. Now, can you roll, kid? I've never rolled in my life. Yeah. Yes, sir, I can. Sure. So I'm trying to stems and seeds, and you don't need, and I'm rolling, uh, man. And two smoking with us. What? Whoa, wait, no. Are no you? way. John and me, we're all going, man. And I'm saying, wow. Because he kept his mask on the whole time, but now he takes it off. Yeah, did you believe that? No, like you just blew my mind. Like, are you surprised? Yeah, after interviewing two and being around two, I, I would have thought that that man never took a drink. Well, I hate to burst anybody's bubble. Holy if you hear this, uh, let me just tell you. Uh, yeah, because we all... That is me. I'm so, I'm so excited for him. Yeah, me too. He was too. Because uh, <laughs> I rolled a horrible joint, man. I really did. But when he did that and we're talking and I'm thinking, holy Christ, here I am with Buck Robley, who I knew, don't call me yellow. I knew, yeah. uh, you know, wrestling too. And I knew about Jonathan Boyd. And I'm going, holy Christ. It's this real, is right? And you're yeah. learning. Yeah. Yeah, you got like all these minds. Now, are you guys talking shop? No, you know, no, we're just up. having a good time. Yeah. I mean, it's not, we're not really talking about what you, John did say, no, kid, you're going to be fine. You're okay. You you did good tonight. You yeah. good, did, did good today. And then later on in Alabama, John was a little more crankier, but he was getting older on, older and a little bit later, you know, later in life. Yeah. And, and he was in the twilight of his career, and, and uh, I was, uh, at a different stage of my life too, and we would have discussions mm -hmm. that, that would wind up with John being right, whether he was right or wrong, <laughs> it didn't matter. He was always right, and I, I agreed with him. But no, it was just a great. It was so great because again, I'm I'm with these guys who I'd watched, read about, known about, and now I'm actually seeing about. Yeah. And I'm seeing the guy. I was surprised you are wrestling too. Actually, took a hit. He had his pipe. You, you knew he saw the yeah, pipe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, he had his pipe. And he's smoking a joint in between. So I, oh, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not disillusioning anyone. No, no, because I, I think everybody that watches th these videos are like, I love cool to everything. Right? Yeah, like, you know, it's. Yeah. Wow, man, that's I can tell you some shit that might blow your mind, but uh, there oh, you go. I can't wait. No, <laughs> good. No, we only All right. Yeah, Sorry, right. Jake. Don't the cut just... me off, Mr. Director. There, there's going to be an old school part two here. Yeah. Now, Louisiana is your first full time territory? No. No? No, 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 no. I just did shots in Louisiana and Arkansas and Mississippi. This is when the split was just taking place between Watts and Lee McGurk. Right. So this happened. My first match was October 20th, 1979, which are coming up on the season, the 19th. Yep. We're actually so tomorrow will actually be 34 years. Wow. Yeah, man. Dig it. So we can date this. Uh, yeah. So uh, I did that part time at different places around that area. And here's the deal Paul Bosch got me booked in Portland, Oregon in January. For Don Owen. For Don Owen. Mm -hmm. Gary Hart booked me in California for Michael Bell. And I didn't realize because Gary came to me one night. I, I was in a battle royal. I have a picture of Andre where I'm on Andre's shoulders. Mm -hmm. and I was, have you? Ever seen it? No. Oh, I'll show it to you after. Yeah, please. No, well, uh, because people say, "When did you work with Andre?" I don't want to say it was a battle royal, but right. it was a battle royal. 
No, the and, Battle Royal in L.A.? No. Or uh, Houston. In Houston. Okay. And this night, Gary comes to me and says, you're booked in L.A. on this date. Well, Paul had told me I was booked in Portland on this date. I didn't think to go to Paul. I just said, okay, Gary's the booker. Gary knows. And Paul knows. He's going to tell Paul. Everything's fine. Thinking everybody's talking to everybody. Oh, sure they are. <laughs> well, I go to L.A., and uh, he says, you're only going to be there two weeks, then you go to Portland. Okay, great. I get there at Chavo Guerrero's booking. Uh, I fly to Fresno. Mark Lewin actually books my flight on PSA. Excuse me, fly to Fresno. I see Andre at the airport. Now, he doesn't... I, he doesn't really know me, and I've only really, you know, just been on his shoulders one time, and, and you know, it's Andre, yeah. and I'm sure he was half tanked, or more than half tanked as well, so I didn't want to say, hey, Mr. Andre, would you like to go to the arena with me? So I just took a cab and got the arena and rode back. Uh, I met that's the first time I met Roddy Piper as well, and uh, Al Madrill remembered me from Texas, but... Anyway, uh, I went to Fresno. That was my first territory. Was Los Angeles. I was mm -hmm. working for Michael Bell. I rode back with uh, the Twin Devils and Frankie Hill from Fresno to LA, which is which is a pretty good trip. Maybe four or five hours, and it just took us all night to get there. And we stayed at the Milner Hotel at Eighth and Flower Street. That's another place I'll never forget because it was right downtown LA, and you don't want to live right downtown LA. <laughs> you really don't. Uh, but there's a nice place called The Pantry and mm -hmm. The Fig, The Figueroa, where the boys would go to the bar uh, and things like that. But it was just a, it was a shithole. Right. And uh, the desk clerk actually went to the eighth floor and jumped off and committed suicide while I was there. Wow. Yeah, it was very cool. So it's stuff like, uh, <laughs> yeah. at the time you're like, man, I'll remember this forever. Ah, uh, yeah. There so, and I did. And I went back years later. Uh, and had somebody actually let the, the guy let me in the Olympic Auditorium, which now I think it's a Korean church. Yeah. But he let me in the Olympic Auditorium just to look around because the the dressing rooms down there were classic. It's I, I believe that's the one in Pulp Fiction where they follow mm -hmm. you know, after Bruce Willis knocks the guy out, kills him. Mm -hmm. Those are the Olympic dressing rooms. It's the hallway down and the separate places. And I met Dr. Jerry Graham my first night there, and he was drunk as shit. But he took the time, he sat there in a room with me and just talking gibberish and I'm saying yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, because it's so cool. Yeah. And uh, that was my first territory with John Tolis and, and Victor Rivera. Victor Rivera, um, wow, he was a Northeast guy for Chris, a while too. Chris Adams. Yeah. Well, I did get to know Chris. I was going to say, that's, that's your first time you met Chris, right? But so yeah, yeah, sure was. Now, what's the pay like for a, a guy, you know, just starting out in his first territory in L.A.? Like, uh, how many days a week are you working? Working all seven? Or uh, we were working, I think, at that time, three to four days. Yeah. And Wednesday was a TV day. Friday was the Olympic house show day. Did you do TV in Bakersfield? No, we did TV in Los Angeles at the Olympic. Okay, Wednesday. Olympic. Okay. Right. Uh, I know Sunday was San Bernardino. Uh, Bakersfield might have been Thursday. San Pedro. We had a house show. Actually, it might have been working five days yeah. in the beginning, but it was like 175 bucks a week. Uh, Mike was not a very good payoff man. Right. But I was wrestling, and I was the Amer one half of the America's Tag Team Champions. Just so nice. you know. Oh, was it was your partner? Was that? Who was your partner? Well, I, I was three, three times. times. And well, one was the first one was Al Madrill. The second was with El Medico, <clears throat> and the third one was with Chris Adams. Oh. Well, yeah, man. So, uh, you know, you give a guy a belt. And I was rookie of the year there, too, in 1980. So Mike knew how to keep the young guys happy. Right. You know, give them Not a paying belt. you much, no, but here you are. You're, you're my champion, champion, the rookie of the year. God, man, are you kidding me? I don't need money. So, are you only in LA for two weeks, or do you stay longer? No, no, longer? no. I was there for over a year. Okay, so you don't go to Portland right away, right? No. I worked at Fujinami, and I got a. Uh, contract to go to Japan out of that. So I got, I got to go to Japan for six weeks working with Fujinami, they filmed my nice there. So it wasn't until later on I learned that nobody's smart than Paul or Donna, Donna or anybody about this. Uh, so I stayed in LA for a year working with Chavo because I asked Chavo, I yeah. said, uh, Am I supposed to go to Portland now? He goes, No, 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 man, you're staying here. Little did I realize he needed talent there because nobody wanted to be there. Right. They weren't making any money. So of course you need me. I'm there for you, man, and I love Chavo, because Chavo's been very good to me, and I got to know him later on, Mondo and Hector, uh, 
went out with his sister Linda a couple times. I mean, they're very nice does people. Does he know that? Yes. Right. Yes, he does. Yeah, and, and Gory again. Gory Guerrero, and again, Gory Guerrero, a guy that, you know, watched in El Paso. Right and, with the funks so, and, yeah. All that stuff. So, I mean, it's all kind of, the, the money circle. wasn't. It wasn't an object then. Man. No, was Don Owen pissed that you didn't you didn't come to. I went. Oregon? To, well, it's funny because I went to Oregon in 1984, mm -hmm. and he the first thing he said to me says, "You know, I was expecting you about four years ago, <laughs> and uh, you never showed up, and I always wondered why." I said, "Mr. Owen, uh, honest to goodness, I didn't understand. I thought that Gary Hart had told Paul. I thought Paul understood. I thought you knew. I thought everybody knew." Yeah. And he just laughed. But because I, he understood how the manipulation happened. Yeah. yeah, it could have been a manipulation or a miscommunication, but it could be two things at the same time. It could time. be whatever they wanted it to be. Right. And it was. Now, how do you end up in Georgia in, I want to say, early 82? Uh, around 82, 83. Yeah. What happened was... Because um, this Santa is the first time I've seen you on TV is Georgia. Yeah, and what happened was I was in San Antonio, and uh, I met this girl, Rat. Yeah, uh, she, but she was beautiful, gorgeous man, most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Oh, whatever yeah. happened to those two girls? Oh, uh, I tell you. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I met her, and uh, we are having a great time. And Jim Barnett comes to the territory, and he's looking for talent. He's just looking. Okay, now I'm 22 years old, I believe, at this time, and he asked for me, and uh, Gino, and uh, somebody else, I think. But wanted me to start, and Buck came. Buck was booking San Antonio at this time, Buck Roebling, and said, uh, "You know, we got your starting date here. Jim Barnett asked for you. The boys stay at the Falcons Rest. Have you heard of the Falcons? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Sure. yeah, fantastic. Sure well, I said, this is where you should stay. No problem. So, I'm supposed to be there on a Saturday TV." Wednesday is San Antonio TV. I'm finishing up. Yeah. Which gives me time to go to Houston on Thursday, Friday, go to Atlanta. So this rat uh, and I woke up for the last time and we smoked some of the greatest sense of meal you've ever had, ever. And uh, one of the referees got it for us. Anyway, so we walk. We're walking around in the fog in San Antonio out of my apartment because we're high and we have nothing else to do. And uh, she starts crying, I don't know what I'll do without you. Well, the next morning I say, well, why don't we just get married? Oh, yeah, why not? I mean, thinking, of course, her mother would say, no. No, you're not going to take my daughter. Are you kidding me? I'm high, Jake. When are you going to, you don't do things on drugs <laughs> the right way. I mean, it's, that's why I say no to drugs. Well, she calls her mom, and her mom says, well, if that's what you want to do, and I just go, Oh, God. Oh, so you're stuck. I am stuck. Well, of course, you have to do a lot of things before you get married, man. And, uh, of course, I'm hoping the courthouse closes and all this other stuff. But no. No. Everything's open? No open. So as we do it, I'm thinking, how am I going to? You know how you have that pit in your stomach and you're going, yeah. oh, my God, what have I done? Well, I'm thinking, no problem. I'll just annul it. It'll be annulled. No problem. You're thinking this as you're going through it. Yeah. Like, oh shit, I've made a mistake. I have been a big mistake. Because. At any point, did you think about like saying, like, hey, this is a bad idea? Or yeah, I did. But, but this was a Mexican family who was well connected to, as we talk about, people who don't mind robbing stores. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, or things of that nature. And I. Uh, anyway. But so, long story short, I go to Atlanta. And uh, there's Tommy, and uh, I met Brad Armstrong for the first time as well. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, shit, what do I do? Got uh, I get a Scottish in. I got my wife with me. No, she didn't, no, she she didn't come in yet. No, no, uh, not yet. I not stayed yet. out of mine. I'm going first, man. Yeah, I'm thinking, cool, I can get here. Everything's fine. I'll get her out of it. Well, of course, I meet Tommy, I meet Brad, I meet the crew, <laughs> Buzz, everybody. And... And, you know, I'm fitting right in because yeah. Tommy Rogers and, golly, man, I don't think who else is there, but it's just... It's a bunch of young, it, it, it is great. guys, yeah. Well, Tommy especially. Well, I'm with that Tommy. I'm first, yeah, I'm, I'm running with Tommy and, and Nick Patrick and Brad, and, and uh, I'm, I was amazed at what Tommy could do in function. I really was. I was amazed. I, was, I, was in, I tried to keep up, but I couldn't. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Piper was there again, yeah. and anyway, so... 
I, I couldn't move into the Falcon's Rest with my wife because it was a two-story house of ill repute, yeah. so to speak. And uh, I'd spent a few weeks there one night, or a couple nights, you know what I mean? I've been, I've been to the boys' places where we have... Uh, Indulged. You know, and, <laughs> indulged many more times. And it was just, it was like, uh, I, I remember Larry Booker would knock on the door and go, cell block number 13, checking in. You know, because it, <laughs> it was that kind of place. It was furnished, and all you had to do was just say, hey, uh, what do you got? Well, I got this. Well, here, I got this. What do you have? Well, let's just put it all together and see what we got. So I got an apartment in Riverdale, and then we get separated. And then all of a sudden, at Christmas time, she gets pregnant. After uh, you get separated? Yeah. So we get back together and oh. we get pregnant. So now I have a daughter on the way. Well, she's not going to have an abortion. She won't do that. Fine. I love my daughter. Um, but for my career at that time, I wasn't ready for this. Now, how old are you at the, at the time when you have the baby? Three. 23. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but we now have the baby but we're separated but you know I, you once you have a daughter once you have a son once yeah. you have a, a, a child you don't it's it's your child and yeah. if you have anything at all you understand it's your child well all right so but i'm still a wrestler and i'm still a whore and i'm no good uh and i continued being what i was and what i am and uh we stayed separated but i paid my child support i didn't live at the falcon's rest with the rest of the boys now what, again, I realized, but I didn't realize. You know, the function, Jim Barnett actually called me in his office my third day there. Ronnie West said, Jim wants to speak to you on Wednesday or Thursday, whatever day it was, down at the Omni. I must have a meeting with you, 10 o'clock. Great. Uh, Jim asked me about, I don't remember exactly how he worded it, but he says, I would suggest you get a divorce. Yes. Did you start off with my boy? Uh, yeah. My boy. My boy. Yeah. I, 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 I was surprised to hear, and Paul was so shocked to hear that you had actually gotten married without telling anybody. Because I didn't tell my mom or dad. Wow. I so didn't tell like, any, dude, we did this like in one day. You told, yeah, man. I have some great blunders in my life. No wonder, can you wonder why I'm in the shape I'm in today? Hmm. Anyway, didn't tell anybody. I'm kayfabe and the whole thing. Well, guess what? The whole Texas, this is San Antonio, my parents live in Houston, but man, does word travel. Yeah. Yeah, I'm learning that one. And Barnett calls me and goes, Mr. Barnett, Jim, calls me in, um, and suggests I get a divorce. I say, I can't do that, instead of saying, yes, sir, I will. Because there was a place called D. Fords. Have you heard of D. Fords? Uh -huh. Very well. I've been to D. Fords, and it's exactly what you're supposed to be at that age and what you're supposed to be doing, because whenever you have women or young girls or people coming to the matches that's why rock and roll drew so well because they were young good looking guys and the kids and the young girls would come and scream and yell and spend money and buy gimmicks and buy tickets and buy all this stuff and that's what he wanted me to do and it, yeah and the, being married if it gets out that you're married then it kills yeah, off the it kills everything yeah. well i didn't tell anybody i was married but damn it to hell Got somebody around. else did yeah so but i i mean it didn't stop me from doing what i did at that time, but I'm very happily married now. Yeah, no. yeah, okay. Anyway, but uh, so that kind of uh, when I was in Atlanta, you know, uh, he also asked me to write Jim Barnett also asked me to write some press releases and do some other things to get me involved uh, in the office. In side? the office, no, get you commentary. Also, I was just about to say, I remember you doing some color commentary sometime. Yeah, and he asked me uh, to do that, and I thought, well, I'm not quite sure why, but I think it's a great idea, you know, to kind of be diverse. I'll never forget, I read an article in, uh, um, oh, one of, I think it was Inside Wrestling, it said uh, Tom Pritchard is Insomniac's best friend uh, because I was so horrible on commentary. Well, Really? So yeah. I didn't think you were that bad. You know what I used to, every <laughs> once in a while when I was a kid, yeah. I would think like, oh, Piper's being so nice. And I turn around and it was you. Well, I wasn't really Piper, I don't think, then. I was a babyface then, but I did Piper later on because it was more, it was one of those things that I wasn't sure who I was, so I knew I was blatantly ripping off Roddy because I, I really, Roddy was such a great guy. And, and he such, such a great, great interview. Well, you do know Roddy. You, how much, can you believe this? One guy I've never met. He's one guy you'll connect immediately with because he, he's, he was one of those guys that as 
at that time in Atlanta, I had met him in California, but in Atlanta, uh, he was one of those guys who understood, look kid, you're not making a lot of money, I'm paying for this. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, look kid, if you need anything, I'm here. Hey kid, don't worry about it. He was all about the boys. He was all about the boys. He would help you out. He was a great guy. He's always been a great guy. He was like a role model to me that I looked up to as a person that I would like to be like. Mm -hmm. No way I could. But I would like to aspire to be like Roddy as far as, look, I'll stand up for the boys. You Don't disrespect me. I won't disrespect you. But if I tell you something, do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that was pretty much what it was. And, and he that's, was always like the young veteran, right? Because yeah. He was, you know. But he had been around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's he was still a young around. guy, but he was he had some miles on him, right? Yeah. And he knew his stuff. Yeah. Man. And that's he was very politically savvy, and uh, I wish I would have listened to a lot more. But it was later on when I started, and I regularly did. I ripped off Roddy because it came a little more natural to me. I thought. I felt. Now I don't know so much because everybody says you're ripping off Piper. But, and I actually told Roddy, when my dad had a heart attack, Roddy called the house when I was home and uh, just to check on, on Bruce and my dad. And uh, I answered the phone. And uh, he was checking on my dad and asked how everything was, doing everything school. And I just said, Roddy, well, I have you on the phone because I had heard that some of the boys were watching when I was doing commentary in Dallas. Yeah. Sherry Martell, Rick Rude, uh, a couple of the other boys from WWF at that time said, uh, why is he trying to be Piper? Rick Rude made a mention of it. And uh, Roddy said, don't worry about that. I think you're doing a great job. Keep, just keep it up. It's all oh, nice. Yeah, so, so you so took it was, more as a compliment. Like, yeah. You know, it was like so a dedication. He, was, he understood. And, yeah. and I, I think he understood. And well, to this day, he's always been that great. I mean, he's just been that kind of guy. So, of course. Was I ripping off Piper? I would, and I told him, if I was ripping you off, I was trying to rip off the best. And yes. That's, that's why I did it. So. Now, after Georgia, is that when you go to Portland? Or? No, I think uh, after Georgia, I went back either to Tennessee or Texas. My first jaunt in Tennessee didn't go too well because, uh, once again, the political atmosphere, I wasn't, you know, I respect Jerry Lawler. Um, I respect Jerry Jarrett for what they've done, okay? But I wasn't really that politically savvy in what I did because I, I was a loner. I had a lot of things going on. My wife was pregnant at the time. So I think I went to Tennessee after Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I got there and I just saw the other bullshit part that really irritated me where this guy talks about that guy and that guy talks about this guy and, and then this guy gets up to Lawler and this guy comes back to this and and it was all this Mickey Mouse horse shit that I just thought, I'm not into this man. So I kind of stood over here while all this other stuff was going over here and I got the, uh, I'll never forget who told me this, Austin Idol said, you know, you have the impression, or you have the, uh, they have the impression you have a bad attitude. Wow. Yeah, I thought, wow, I didn't know that. I just thought I had a stay away from me attitude, which is a bad right. attitude. You have to be in the mix if you're going You can to call it shit, mix. but you're in the mix. If you don't, right. you you're, might be, uh, well, yeah. this guy thinks he's better than all of us. Right, and I don't know if that was it or if it was just, you know, that because I just didn't want to listen to them drama bullshit. Yeah. There's a lot of drama bullshit going on back then. So Now what what year's that? 83? I believe so. 83, something around there, 82. In that in that area, because I get lost. Is this where the, the first version of the Heavenly Bodies are with Pat Rose? No, no, no. That, that's that later, right? That, that was after Louisiana. Okay. Okay, because 84, in the summer of 84, I went to Portland. Right. I went maybe before the summer, but I was in in, in Portland for the summer of 84. And then no, I, who's there with you? Buddy Rose? Buddy Rose, uh, Wyskowski, Brett Sawyer, Matt Bourne. Was Kurt Henning there is he in Minneapolis? Kurt was there. No, Kurt yeah. was there, as a matter of fact. Uh, and he was getting rid of Billy see, Jack? Billy Jack was there, yeah. Now, was Billy Jack, like, batshit crazy then? Or no. Or was he all right? No, Billy wouldn't let us smoke in his apartment. Uh, Mondo Guerrero and I went over to the house, and he made it very clear. He invited uh, He in Portland. Yeah. Uh, he asked Mondo, oh, hey, would you guys like to come over uh, tonight and watch a, a tape of something? 
I forgot exactly why we were going to go over, but he says, guys, I just want to let you know I don't smoke and I don't drink. And I don't want you to do it in my place either, okay? Mondo and I kind of look at each other and go, yeah, man, okay, no problem. So we smoked before we got there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, of course, so we get in and, and, and we're watching the tape, but it's just, I mean, Billy Jackie, this was when he just came back from New York. Uh -huh. And Don walked in the dressing room and said, oh, here's a big New York star back home now, huh? I see. Yeah, great. Worked out for you, didn't it? Billy didn't say anything. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know what was going on with him back then. I mean, I knew his dad was in bad shape. He was almost blind and things like that. And Which they built into, like, his character, too. Right. Yeah. And we, I thought he was a great guy, a nice guy. But later on, you know, of course, we all fall, stumble, and have to find our way. That guy fell from the eighth, the eighth floor. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So no, it was a, it was a, Portland was a great time, man. I got to tell you because uh, that I did get to know Kurt a little bit there, um, and Kurt was a great guy. Jerry yeah. O. I don't know if you remember oh, Jerry, Jerry O. Jerry O. Okay, yeah. yeah. Jerry did pass away, I think. Was Dynamite there at the time? No, or was he, he had just left. Just left. Uh, we, I was supposed to work with Dynamite in L.A. one time when he was coming back from uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. He just bypassed L.A. because. No good payoff, and it wasn't worth it. And I think he had left a month before I got to Oregon, too. Oh, okay. So we. So uh, Portland was more of a, a smaller guy's, you know. You didn't have his, uh, the, the, you know, Louisiana, big, big, tough guys. Portland was more. Well, Portland was more, I would say, we had Bobby Jaggers so there, we had Ed Wiskowski. Yeah. Rip couple, Oliver. Yeah, Rip Oliver. Yeah. And uh, Dave Sierra, the assassin. Yeah. There were some bigger guys, but. Don was more key on working. Don yeah. was more key on excitement. And, it's, and it's, the crowd was into exciting matches. And yeah. You could do things that, uh, um, if, you, if you could work, so to speak, Don wanted the working part. Mm -hmm. And we'd have two out of three fall matches still and go back to the dressing room and things like that. It was just so, I think they sent guys to the uh, Pacific Northwest just because it's more up in the corner, out of the way, you can learn, nobody's going to... Uh, uh, see you too much, right. and, and you can hone your craft. That's why Snooker, Piper, and, you know, all the guys Piper. go up there first and kind of get the groundwork down, and then you kind of veer out and venture out and find your way. Now, Don Owen, like Paul Bosch, was always has the reputation of being a good payoff guy too. You know, a straight up guy. Yeah, yeah. Don and Barry both um, would pay, especially for a small territory like that. You could work six, seven days a week, mm -hmm. make five hundred bucks a week. And during that time, that was pretty darn good money. So if I was underneath making five hundred a week, I don't know what the top guys were making, but uh, it was pretty decent for us. We just loved working. I mean, back then yeah. you just wanted to work, and that's what you could do. I mean, you, we we could go along and in, in Oregon again, chocolate mescaline. I mean, and uh, what? Uh, I'm sorry, chocolate milkshakes. Things like that. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, you know, your judgmental smile. I'm about to, that camera guy, whatever, <laughs> right. he might be just, you know, I'm trying to be honest yeah. here and open. And, and I don't think you really appreciate that. But that's okay, we're not worried about it. Now, after Portland, where do you go? Uh, Portland is when I came home uh, for Christmas and went to visit the boys in Houston. Yeah. Bill Dundee's booking now. This is at the end of the midnight rock and roll run. So uh, I talked to Bill and I'd already been in Portland for a year, and I said, Bill, if there's any chance just to get me in here, would it be, would it be okay? I'll do what I can do for you, mate. I go back to Oregon, uh, January, Bill calls me two weeks later, says, hey, I got a date for you, would you, would you take it? So I said, by all means, I give two weeks notice to Don, I'm gone. Come down to Louisiana, uh, as I said, rock and roll, midnight are just finishing up, I meet Ted DiBiase, Brad, Armstrong is yeah. still there, Ernie Ladd is still there, but I'm still kind of a loner, I'm still kind of a, uh, I've just never been one of those guys that, you know, just because you're the booker, just because you're the guy, I gotta suck up to you, you know, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, man, I mean, I, I respect you, but, but at the same time, man, I don't want to do it just cause, because I saw how everybody did it, you know what I mean, you gotta go up and, and it was bullshit, you know, had, and I should have learned how to bullshit better, but I didn't. Uh, but, but I got to, in Louisiana, I, was, uh, I shared an apartment with Brad Armstrong and Tim Horn. Mm -hmm. So at that time in my life, I was going through some pretty heavy things. Some very dark days were damping my doorstep or darkening my doorstep. And I walked to the ring, and I'll never forget this because this was a pivotal point. 
Um, and I actually told Bill Watts this when he got inducted in the Hall of Fame. Watts came to me and says, have you ever thought about being a heel? And I said, every day. <laughs> and up until this point, you have never been a heel? No. Holy yeah. shit. Wow. Every day, man. Uh, because I just had this, I, I hated the world. I hated life. Uh, it was, I was, I was working with guys in the ring, a guy named Ed Carbu Thomas. You ever heard of Ed Carbu? No. Oklahoma wrestler uh, and, and Bill Watts loved, you know, amateur wrestlers and, football players and real athletes and things like this and Ed Carbu couldn't tie his shoes okay but he was a great amateur wrestler and they booked me with him man like for two months straight and I couldn't stand it and and one night he hurt himself and he went down and I covered him and Ronnie West was a referee and Ronnie went one two three <laughs> Okay, because that car couldn't, he couldn't kick out. Yeah, but it was one of those times yeah. I went, oh my God, I'm going to get fired. But he couldn't kick out. He hurt himself, he, whatever it was. Um, so Bill asked me if I'd like to be a heel. I said, oh my God, yes. And uh, so he turned me heel with Horner, although even the bump we... Something always sabotaged. I sabotage myself. But I was supposed to drop Horner on the rail outside the ring, so we drop him on the rail. And instead of him just taking the bump smoothly over, he kind of stops and then does the bump over. Oh. And it just looked kind of like that shit, you know, where you you hit the rope, or you're about to hit the rope, and you stagger, and you stop yeah. for a minute. Oh, that's so awkward looking. But the point was, they turned me heel. So I, got, so I now had an opportunity to run with uh, DiBiase, with uh, Dr. Death, with uh, the, the heels at the time. Now, I really don't know Ted that well, and I'm, I'm very, again, not so much now, but back then I was very much a loner. I didn't want to say the wrong thing, especially to a guy like Ted DiBiase. Right. But Ted's one of us. I mean, he is one of us. Yeah. He understands. Well, real quick story. Um, you know, I can't ride. You know, the heels and baby faces always stayed apart. Different hotels, different rats, different things like that. Now I'm hanging with Doc, DiBiase. Um, I'm trying to think. Humperdinck had just come in the territory. Couple other guys, and Doc is the one. Doc Death, Steve Williams, the one who said, "Hey, one of these, one of these bitches out here wants to meet you afterwards. You to come to the bar with us." I'm there, man. So, yeah. And now I'm seeing the heel side, and there. I mean, baby faces have fun. Yeah. But the heels, because the girls like the bad guys. Yeah. And it was really cool. So it was it was it. Different rats, like the, yeah, like your baby face rats were different, like than your like your heel rats. Like, was it like different personalities or like? I don't know if you different could... shit they did in bed or. Because... I don't. I don't know right. if you could say it was that as much as it was. Uh, totally. They seem to have. Them. Well, they seem to have a different breed, man. I don't know if it was because the baby faces were assholes and the heels were better. Right. You know what I'm saying? It could have been that, but I, I wrote. I, the, what I was going to say is I rode to a town with TBS. He just had a new Datsun. And I had to ride to, uh, it was New Orleans. And New Orleans is famous for the fans being just rowdy, rowdy, rowdy. This is my first trip to New Orleans now as a heel. And I'm riding with the top heel, TBS. And, and Brad's the one who set it up. He goes, mm -hmm. just ask Ted, man. He's cool. And he told me, he says, he's one of us, man. He's not, you know, he's one of us. Even though he's just top heel. Top guy, yeah. Okay, he's one of us. Well, I get in the car, I don't know what to say because I'm awkward, I just social, I always had the social problem, mm -hmm. just relating to people. But as we get to New Orleans, we pull up and there's a crowd of people, maybe 20, I'm not quite sure the exact number, but it's, a, it's more than one, okay, or two. It was 20, Jake. We're having problems. <laughs> just, I was just so going to settle in. Okay, anyway. Uh, but the deal is we get out and uh, we're getting our bags. And somebody says something to DiBiase, and we're walking, and it's just semicircle. And uh, as we stop, Ted turns around and says, "What did you say?" And before the guy had a chance to say anything, Ted slapped him down. Wow! There's 20 of them and two of us. Now there's actually one and a half of us because, uh, you know, I'm not so sure I'm that bad. <laughs> okay, but DiBiase is, and he slapped the guy down. But now I'm looking. And I know the reputation like of New Orleans, more, and, I, yeah. and I'm realizing that there's a possibility that we're going to have to do something. But everybody just scattered and backed up. 
And that's what it was. He said, just keep walking. Right. I imagine he kept walking. And that's what he, he taught me then is you, you hit one, you make sure they know you're not going to back down. You show fear and they're going to yeah. pull on me like those jackals. And I went, holy shit, because <laughs> it was pretty damn close. Yeah. And I'd heard all the stories, but, um, and, and I saw some things in New Orleans with the cops and, and people who did cross that line. Yeah. Yeah, man. They, well, the cops would do, do the number on them, or? Well, yes. Yeah. I mean, yes, they actually would. They would take them in the uh, back of the New Orleans. Uh, I don't know if there's any. Uh, I think statute of limitation probably. Right. Uh, but anyway, they, if, if somebody else something retired. hit the guys, whatever it may be, uh, they used to take the guys, and you know where they keep the chairs sometimes in the back yeah. of the arenas? Take them back there and beat the living shit. Just so the people knew, beat the living shit out of them. And let them know, you know. Yeah, don't touch the wrestlers. Don't touch the wrestlers. Don't don't mess with us, man. So, no. yeah. Now being a heel, how did that change your 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 wrestling life? Like, did you, like this whole new? Because now, you know, people that don't know, you know, it's always been known that, especially in those days, the heel was the leader of the match. Right. Like, you, you know, babyface's job was to sell. The heel's job is the lead. Now you're the leader. Like, yeah. how much fun is that compared to? That was the coolest part. Yeah. Because in the beginning and. Well, in the beginning, I was working with Horner around the around the horn because yeah. that's the guy I turned on. So it was kind of cool because I was getting to beg off and I was getting to call things for him that I was taking the bumps for now. And I knew that I felt, I felt, let me say this, I didn't know at that time, I felt I could get him over doing what I was doing. Once I got comfortable doing that, and I was always more comfortable, I felt so much more natural as a heel because people, <laughs> I don't really think they like that skinny little ass baby face anyway. You know what but I mean? But you could talk to, like, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean, man? Yeah. So it's like, okay, great. Because I don't like you either. I really didn't like people. And I really did have this idea. It's so therapeutic to go out <laughs> there and just say, hey, you know, go screw yourself. So, I mean, I enjoyed that. And, and once I became more adept at it, that it's my job, I felt, I felt better doing things for them than I was having the guys do things for me, if yeah. that makes any sense. No, it makes tons of sense. And, and I, I really enjoyed it. I, I liked it, and it became more of who I really am. Because once you got all that out, you know, you could come back, and you could relax a little better. And yeah. at that time, once again, I am happy with marriage, just so you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, the girls want to know, are you really an asshole, or are you different than those assholes over there who think they're greater or better than you? Right. And that's kind of how it was. I mean, that's what I was talking about. The heels had a different kind of... They wanted the bad boy, but you guys they were They wanted to see cool if they could like... tame you, or they wanted yeah. to see... Not tame you, or they wanted to see how bad you were. Well, if you're that bad or if you're that good, huh. or if you're good at that... If you're that good at being bad, if you get my drift. And I didn't, you know, look, I did some things I'm not proud of, but I did a lot of things I am proud of, so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, that and you'll find out. Where where does the, the doctor name come from? Where, how did you think of this? How much tape do we have? Uh, okay, I have a little bit left, yeah. I know, okay. Well, Slowly. here's the deal. I uh, was wrestling in the Louisville during my Memphis run. Uh, one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, this is during the first Heavenly Bodies run, actually, with Sherry Martell and Pat Rhodes uh, as my partner. And we were wrestling the Fabs, mm -hmm. Steve Kern and uh, Stan Wayne in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, again, have you been to the Louisville Gardens? Louisville, oh, yeah. So you know yeah. the downstairs dressing room? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Stan knocks me off the apron, and as I land, go to the apron, I land on the floor, I break my ankle. Oh. But I didn't know it was broke. Right. I just twisted it, and I, but I knew I hurt it. Uh, so we get back up on I get back up on the apron and I continue with the comeback. They they continue their yeah. comeback. I continue feeding. We do all the stuff. So I know I hurt my ankle, but I think I just twisted it. And I'm walking back to the dressing room. I've got to walk down the stairs, through that little um, area, into the team dressing room, and. As the guys come back, you know, I get up and shake their hand, thank you, thank you, and get my shower. And I'm riding with uh, Juan Reynoso, who was Taurus Bulma mm -hmm. back then, Billy Travis. Um, oh, I loved Billy Joe Travis. Yeah, and myself. Now, Billy Travis, Juan, Wendell Cooley, and I all were now staying in a room at the Days Inn in Nashville. Four wrestlers with two beds, a couch, and a floor. All right? Well, uh, I'm riding with Billy and Juan. I have to walk 
back up the stairs, out the door, and we were parked a little farther away under the Louisville uh, garage. Get in the car, we stop at our usual stop. I don't know what type of uh, Tylenol I had that night, but I took about six of those and a six pack of Miller Lite, thinking everything would be okay. We go to the day's end, I ask if I can sleep on the couch, boom, wake up the next day, black, or it's not black yet, it's just kind of bruised. I work all week taping it up, taking... Wow, so you're working on a broken arm. Broken arm, oh. didn't know it was broke though, but I'm taking, I believe, Soma's, Percocet, Vicodin, whatever I had, whatever anybody else had too. So we're doing this, I'm working every night. The next week comes around next Tuesday to Louisville, my entire ankle is black, my foot is black, and every night I had someone tape it up. Well, I was in one of those individual rooms in Louisville, and Dundee comes around and says, hey, mate, you might want to have that looked at. Well, Sherry was also coming around the corner at the time. She goes, I'm going to come in tomorrow. I'm going to take you to the hospital. Uh, her roommate, Tina, mm -hmm. was a nurse. Okay. I'm trying to, uh, long story, but it, yeah, it's no, it's all good. adds it's into good. it. Uh, the next day, she picks me up. Sherry picks me up at the hotel, takes me to the hospital. Tina gets me right in, x-rays the ankle. It's broke. Puts me in a cast right there. Well, anybody who's ever worked Memphis in those days knows if you don't work, you don't, you don't get paid. And you weren't really getting paid anyway, to be honest with you. Uh, but now I'm kind of screwed. But Sherry says, listen, just why don't you come over to our apartment? Uh, I'll take care of you. Um, Tina and I will take care of you, no problem. And, and I never mess with Sherry. She's a great lady. We just yeah, had a professional lady. relationship, yeah. and that was it. Um, but as I did, you know, Tina, as a nurse, brought the scrubs because it's easier to put on. You know, just have scrubs to wear for my cast. And uh, I knew this wasn't going to last, so I had a buddy of mine and my dad came to Mem to Nashville to help me drive my car back to Houston so right. I could recuperate. Well, she had given me about four pairs of scrubs to wear. In the meantime, while I'm convalescing at home, Brad Armstrong calls and says, hey, would you like to come to... Pensacola, or are you planning to go back to Memphis? I said, oh, man, let's see, Memphis, Pensacola. Yeah, little white yeah. sandy beaches or um, yeah, Memphis. So I said, sure, man, I'll be ready in three weeks. I mean, that's when I'm supposed to get it off. Everything's cool. It's great. Now we've got this starting date for you. Horner's here. We'll work the angle. We'll show the deal from Louisiana. Perfect. All right, I'm in Pensacola. We're doing TV in Birmingham. Robert has this great idea. There's a fellow who... Uh, happened to be a riding companion and uh, he just happened to be a friend of the boys extracurricular activities uh, he wants to do something on TV okay so they shoot this angle where it's Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden against uh, Johnny and Tommy Rich at the end of the match they get uh, they tape uh, Tommy to the rope uh, Johnny, I think they taped Johnny's feet to the ropes or whichever one I one of them. Beat the shit out of them, get blood, all this mm -hmm. other stuff. Then they go right to the interview stand. It's Robert Fuller, Jimmy Golden, and uh, this new guy. And they say, we're going to run those dirty riches out of town, out of this this area. we got our cut man here, Dr. Love. Ain't nothing going to happen to our pretty faces right here, boys. You better be sure and watch out. And uh, Gordon's saying, we got to go, we got to yeah. go, got to go. Man, a great angle. They're all really excited about it and that very next week when it airs right I mean within an hour after the show airs Robert gets a call from the FBI and they're looking for this Dr. Love guy <laughs> well yeah I mean they've been looking all over and where is he well sir we don't know he's just one of them guys that shows up sometimes and hell we just use him we ain't really got no numbers on him or nothing but by gosh we'll sure to help you boom angle's done yeah yeah. So I was riding with Jimmy and Rob. What's what the FBI looking for him for? Do you know? Well, yeah, there happened to be a snowcap somewhere, and uh, somebody might have been, uh, you know, an international snow incident might have happened, and uh, another fellow by the same name uh, actually was detained at the airport. Um, Wow. I don't know if this guy's dead yet or not, so I don't know if I'm going to say any names, but a, a, a wrestler who has his same build uh, was detained at the airport because he has the same name, almost identical description, 
but different. And this guy was detained for three days, okay, the wrestler. And yeah. then this guy then comes on TV and the FBI says, oh, wait a minute. Somebody from the FBI this guy. is watching our show, okay? So uh, I'm riding with Jimmy and Robert, and I happen to be wearing my scrubs that day. And Robert Your cast me, is off at this time. Oh, well, I'm working. For yeah, I've been there for about three months at this time. So now they're just comfort pants. Yeah, they're just, they're just past you. Yeah, you used to wear like, it's like uh, uh, Zubat. Yeah, 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 of course. And uh, we were going, riding the van, doing our uh, homework, as we always did. Um, and Robert's talking, like, damn, man, now i got to think of something else. So we stopped to get a drink and kind of get out. And, you know, it's been, I don't know, I guess Robert didn't notice earlier, but as we were going to the store, he looks at the patch and goes, hot damn boy right there. Hell, you can be our doctor. And I said, well, there we go. Doctor I mean, Tom. and we start talking about how, how I became a doctor. We only went to Baylor University. I just spent a little too much time in the pharmacy. Otherwise, I would have got my doctor's degree. I would have been a doctor, and the rest is history. Wow. So breaking my leg in Louisville, getting the scrubs, going creates to Pensacola. The, creates the monarchy. Dr. Love was uh, a... Uh, Extracurricular. We could call action. him a snowman. Yes. Yes. Okay. Wow, yeah. so you're Dr. Tom there. Yeah. Now, um... Jake, I'm going to punch you, I swear. And this is over. Now, Continental is where you really start start to shine, you know, right? Because you start yeah. off as healed, and then there's the, the big baby face turn. Now. At the time, does Eddie Gilbert come in the book? Because there was the big road to Birmingham. Was the, um, and then was it a switch over from Continental Wrestling to Continental Wrestling Federation? Or right. What was the what was the big build for that? Because well, I mean, they positioned you as that top guy in that. Right. But the thing was, every everybody in Continental was a top guy, pretty much. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, it was it was every match was either a championship match or they tried to make it something, which yeah. when you try and make it something, then it becomes nothing. So I, I understand that. But I was very fortunate, and they gave me a great opportunity, and I'm not discounting anything at all. I was very fortunate to be where I was at, especially with the Armstrongs, mm -hmm. uh, best friends in the world. And uh, that's how that happened. But what, what happened with Eddie coming in uh, was the changing of the business the way the business was happening and you know Ron Fuller was a smart enough guy to understand he could see the writing on the wall he, he had his hockey team as well yeah uh, but he was wanting out so he found a guy David Woods to buy and uh, at the same time I'm not sure how Eddie got the job I just know that when Ron got out and sold uh, to David uh, the owner, the other owners were Robert, Jimmy Golden, Bob Armstrong. Right. They were not too, too happy. Fam, like a family organization. Yeah. yeah. The Welches but, and the, the James. Yeah. So they weren't very happy. But houses weren't. Business was not doing very well. Mm -hmm. Eddie came in. Business did pick up a little bit. It did. Doing doing good. But we had to switch from Batwell Auditorium to the fairgrounds, which was not not, not a real great part of town. Uh, so people really didn't come out too much for that. So Eddie came in with Paul E, and Paul E, at that time especially, could be very abrasive. Oh, yeah. I, I love Paul. I mean, of course, we all know yeah, Paul. Yeah. But, but, you know, this New York Yankee coming to the South, you know, yeah. you, got, you got people that... Um, take that pretty seriously. And he didn't have a filter either. You know, no, he, no, Paul was very, yeah, and I appreciated that about Paul because yeah. I understood, I understood that kind of guy. He was very passionate and he's one of those guys. You know, my brother is one of, Bruce yeah. is one of those guys. He just, damn, you don't like it? Well, I'm sorry. You're going to hit the wall because he's not backing up. Uh, so when Eddie came in, um, we were doing things and I just, it's because we did have the momentum, and, and I was just very fortunate to be positioned where I was, the way things happened, and that the road to Birmingham happened, and uh, and that happened. Now, one of my favorite storylines, angles, anything you want to say, and I still think it's amazing TV that you probably can't do anymore, is Dr. Tom Pritchard, Dirty White Boy, Dirty White Girl. Yeah. And I like... Even if like I watch it on YouTube now, it is one of the most compelling ten minutes of of television any time because of like I always believe in today's world, a guy turns babyface and 
all the baby faces accept him right away. Right. You know, oh, I don't care what you've done for the last six months. You're our buddy now because you dress in our locker room. Where here, you and Dirty White Boy are going at it, you know, for months. You know, this thing. Dirty White Girl is, you know, awful bitch. person. Yeah, and a total bitch. She comes on the set and she's. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, she's obviously, you know, had an altercation with the Dirty White Boy. And the thing that I love about it is you, you call bullshit right away, and so does the fans. Like you know, you see this as this is a this is a ploy. Like this, I thought that was the smartest part right away. It's like why would you believe her? You know, maybe she deserved it. Maybe this, and then finally, you, you know, as a baby face, your heart starting. Oh man, this woman. And not to the point where you're just like, oh, I feel so bad for you. It was to that point where you almost started to believe that the boom, there it was. And I thought that was the craziest thing. Did you guys get heat for on the? Was it uh, anywhere from it? Like doing like a domestic violence angle? Like no. See, I I, I don't think it, we really got heat from anybody for doing that. What I when I watched that back because we were going to do something recently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that I, we're gonna preface with that. The thing that got heat with me is as he's dragging, as White Boy's dragging me 50 feet from the interview stand to the ring, there's a cop just standing there watching. Not doing <laughs> yeah, and it's not doing anything that's gonna arrest this guy for attempted murder or yeah, assault right. or anything. And the people are screaming. And I thought that to me stood out more than anything. But yeah. I mean, the angle, kind of, the way the angle came about is I remember watching again as a kid in El Paso, there was a guy called the Hangman. Mm -hmm. And Nick Bockwinkle came in the ring to save this guy one time, and the hangman took his noose and put it around Nick's neck and beeled him from corner to corner. And I always thought, that is so wild. And, I, and Eddie was looking for an angle to, to kind of move this along. So Tony and I got together, and we came up, because everybody gives Eddie the credit, and I give Eddie the credit for allowing us to do it, but this was our idea from Kim, the dirty white girl, mm -hmm. chloroforming, me in the street fight, he wins the title. Yep. The next week, I hit him with a board. I cut his hair. The next week, she comes up with a black eye, and she wants to talk to me. And I said, "Okay, what if he hangs me?" And he says, "Okay, but we need more than that. What, what are we gonna do?" I said, "All right. Well, how about this? Um, what if? Because he wanted to get rid of the backdrop. He wanted a new backdrop. Eddie okay, yeah, because you guys destroyed yeah. the backdrop. I said, "Well, yeah. what if? What if?" Tony comes from behind, nails me, and throws me into the backdrop. We get rid of it, man, just destroy it. Handcuffs my hands behind my back, puts the noose room in it, and drags me to the ring and just hangs me, man. I mean, there's no way to stop it. Yeah. Okay. Great, good idea. The night before, or pardon me, the night of the angle, Randy Copley. One of the moon took, dogs. Yeah, yeah. Took a needle, drew blood from my arm, put it in a rubber, and as the referee comes out, when you see the referee, he puts the rubber in my mouth. But you see, we didn't tie it tight enough to where my bill would bite yeah. down. Yeah. It would come, because I'm trying to bite down as yeah. it's hanging me. And Steve Armstrong had a blade to poke it if it didn't work, which he, he does, and you can look at it at the end of it. He almost throws up because it's so bad, it's horrible. You smell the smell. Uh, so you never really see the blood on TV, but the blood was supposed to go down on, on this yellow shirt. Yeah. And, and as she's choking me, rubs ruptures my throat, kind of like Grizzly Smith. Yeah. <gasps> you know, things like that. So, I mean, um, we didn't get any heat necessarily uh, officially. Maybe other people didn't like it. Uh, the Rape Crisis Center line was just one line. I just came out with what, because I thought, what would you do? I mean, I mean, once again, at that time, you know, the culture was what it was. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I'm just... Well, that's, that's what I was, what I was saying. thinking. Like, do, do people like watching it say, "Oh my God!" No matter even if she, you know, manipulated this whole thing, he beat her yeah. to create this. Like, and I don't think you can do that today oh. because of the culture being what it is. And I, and that's the crazy thing about wrestling is it's not the same as it used to be, but neither is the world. But why does wrestling have to be so politically correct? Like. Wrestling throughout history has, you know, exploited stereotypes and races and stuff like that. But, like, we do something and they'll be like, oh, I can't believe they took that step. But you watch on TV, there's fucking zombies getting shot in the face and serial killers and stuff. And but 
But what you have to remember Why are we is held in high regard all of a no, sudden. No, I understand that, but but you have to understand that wrestling is this when you have Totinos and Free Pebbles and yeah. all these other sponsors and movies and things yeah. like this. So you're not talking about just wrestling, you're talking about wrestling and everything that encompasses it. And actually it's just a big circle because wrestling is just that part. Yeah. And I've learned that especially these last two years, uh, <laughs> that it's not the major part. It's just a part and if we get a guy out of this part to play multiple roles, if we can get another Rock or another Cena, you know, people can say whatever they want about Cena, but for all that's awesome. Yeah, exactly that's awesome. what I'm saying. I mean, that, that's what they're looking at. They yeah. don't care. I mean, I think Justin Gabriel's a tremendous worker. Yeah. What the hell are they doing with him? Absolutely nothing. Right. I think he, and I'll say this too, just for on the record, he's Slater, I think, is a tremendous worker. Let him go. Let him be him. Yeah. He'll be fine. But when you constrain somebody like that, or it's a sterile environment, it's a little hard sometimes for these guys to understand how to manipulate yeah. their way through the, the, system. the puzzle. Yeah, our system, yes. Now, what, what year does Bruce go to work for Vince? 87? God, he was there for 22 years, so maybe 80, uh, yeah, 86, 87, I guess. Yeah, he was there for a while. Now, once, once Bruce goes to, to WWF, um, is there any talks of you going up there? Why is that? Or is he still just trying to make his name? Like, is there no, like, have you, have you, did you ever say, Bruce, just to open a door and sure. I'll kick it in, you know? Or... By all means I did. Uh, but, but here's the thing. Uh, while I did that, once again, my social awkwardness with mm -hmm. everyone, including my family, uh, kind of intervened because I didn't know how to say what I needed to say the right way. So it became more of a burden, I believe. And then it got to the point where, you know what, I'm just going to drop it. Yeah. And there was a, that those awkward years where he knew and I knew, but let's just drop it. Right, so let's not. Let's not even meet here. Let's just kind of go over here. Right. So while I'm working Memphis or I'm doing this, he's doing this. He's doing Brother Love and yeah. he's doing great. So while, of course, I would have loved to have been there, I didn't fit anywhere in their plans. In their mold, right? Yeah, it wouldn't work. Right. And I didn't want to... I, there was a time where I would say, look, can I just get anything? Can I get anything? Well, looking back on it, that wasn't right for me to do because right. he's got his gig. I have mine. I have to earn it. Right. You don't just get it. You have right. to earn it. I totally and, agree. Uh, so, yeah, of course there was talk about it, but then I resigned. As soon as I resigned myself not to, and uh, I went, my final destination was going to be smoking out wrestling. Right. Was, yeah. That was going to be it. I was, I was just going to be happy to be working in the South. Yeah, and that was it, man. Because you you just not done after uh, Continental. You you do another long tour duty in Memphis. Yeah. You know now now Smoky Mountain. Yeah, I was you know, done. I now mean, was now done. Stan Lane becomes your partner. Right. Now does Stan give a notice or does he pretty much abruptly leave? No, he gave notice. Stan's deal was uh, we weren't look we were not making a lot of money in Smoky right. Mountain either. I just wanted to wrestle. Yeah. I just wanted to be in the business. I was happy to be with Jim Cornette. I was happy to be with the, in the area. I love Jim Cornette. Yeah. I mean, uh, people can say what they want about him, and he is everything you can say. But he's been loyal to me. I have to be loyal to him. He, he gave me a break when nobody else would. And it just so happened that and this was during the... <laughs> Business wasn't great in WWF at this time either. Right, yeah, you're talking about early so 90s, yeah. They were looking for talent too, and Jim and my brother had a rep rapport, and uh, so they got along, and this is how that came about too, uh, when they needed somebody to work fresh. And yeah. Jerry Jarrett was up there, Vince was going through the trial, and, well, and you weren't making a whole lot of money, and there were no guaranteed contracts at that time right. either. Uh, so that's that was in the meantime when I'd already asked, and then I finally just gave up and said, look, man, I will be content. I will never work Madison Square Garden. I'll never work for WWE. I'm cool with it. Yeah. I'm fine with it. So you to a point where you've accepted it, accepted, right? So yeah. even if, if it happens, it's now gravy. Yeah, exactly. It's all cool. So you go up there, and, and now how different is, because I, I, I know Jimmy a little bit, how different is it teaming with Stan Lane to Jimmy Del Rey? So you now that you got 
different in ring, but different out of the ring too, right? Sure. Okay. Yeah, so, so you know Jimmy Del Rey a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. I mean, I met him that first weekend I met you. Right. Right. Well. And then I. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's the deal. Here's the difference. Um, with Stan, Stan was already part of a successful tag team. He already had his deal. Stan, Stan. If you if you know Stan, two you know, two big tag teams. You of know, course. Babs and Midnight. Yes. Yeah. So he's had success. Yeah. So he, he knows, and and so now you're now you're kind of regulating down to uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, where he wasn't making the money he's making, and he was traveling from Charlotte to Knoxville, which mm -hmm. is you know he just wasn't digging it, man. He wasn't feeling it. So, but I got along great with Stan. Yes. Yeah. You know, some people didn't care for him, but it's because he didn't. I don't. I think it's because he didn't understand who who he was or what he was. As long as you understand what Stan is. Mm -hmm. He is the gangster of love. He, yeah, he's happily married now, but but he's I I got along great with him. He's fantastic. In the ring, I thought he was a tremendous worker. Yeah. I thought he was great. I I had no issues whatsoever. Um, so I mean, he just couldn't. He was getting older as well, and I understand that man. I went to WWE when I was thirty three. Yeah. So most of these guys now, I mean, I think Punk's going to turn thirty five shortly. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, he's on. Uh, he's know, been there eight years already. Yeah, Can you believe that. So that's what I'm saying. You know, he, he's he's there. He's yeah. been there for a while. So anyway, but then we get um, we're looking for a partner. Now we need to find a partner quick. Did you have anybody in mind? I had nobody that I knew of that could that was available. Right. Nobody that I mean could do it. I would love to have one of the Armstrongs. We're in the middle of an Armstrong. They're babyface. You can't yeah. do it. But Kevin Sullivan is a guy who recommended Jimmy Del Rey. And his reasoning was um, he's a great worker. Uh, he he. Jimmy always took care of Kevin, and I understood that reasoning. I get it. I follow it. But, uh, you know, Jimmy came in the first night, and I had met Jimmy once or twice uh, along the way somewhere in Memphis. Because he was wrestling, uh, is Jimmy back in like Florida and Memphis. And yeah, and I met him, you know, and, uh, you know, no issues whatsoever. We just, you know, he gets to, uh, I think it was Johnson City the first night, and, uh, and he's missing the tooth, and uh, not a big deal, but... You know, he's, he's, you know, smoking cigarettes back there. And it's not a big, you know, I'm just saying, just kind of the impression. Polar opposite, opposite Polar of Stan. Opposite, correct. And, and, and he's, um, you know, Stan worked out. And at that time I was working out still a little bit. But, uh, you know, you, you find sometimes you just get out of that mode. Yeah. Okay, well, I was, I was there, but Jimmy really hadn't been working out. But, but I, I was ready to just say, look, man. Got to give it a try because I, there's nobody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are we going to do? Need somebody right away. Yeah, yeah. So we do it. So we figured it out. So we have to come up with a name. Well, Jimmy Delray is my cousin from Delray, Florida. Yeah, that's a great, great name. He, well, that quick, huh? Huh? Well, yeah. That's Jimmy's. That was Cornette's idea. Yeah. That quick. And uh, so, so he goes out with with one of the boys. I think uh, that night or one of the first nights he's in, and and of course. With some of us, when we drink, we don't always, uh, you know, we turn into different people. I was going to say, you become you know, Dr. Yeah. Jekyll. And Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I think that's kind of what happened. And once again, you know, we were just two different people. Uh, but once he got in the ring, I mean, I couldn't deny his work. I won't yeah. deny his work. But we, we just had different views uh, about things. We had um, uh, different ideas about things, you know, outside the ring. Yeah. And that's cool. I mean, I don't, I don't begrudge anybody, but... I, I just don't want to be uh, in the same vicinity if shit goes down. Yeah. And that's one, that one you, reason why yeah. I locked myself in my room yeah. when I knew uh, that I would might be out of control. And t tag partner right? And, uh, you, yeah, and you have one to, guy gets in trouble. You're, you're in trouble too. Right, and especially if you're in the same place. And, and I'll never forget Michael Hayes always telling me, he says, "Man, you got to have that chemistry in and in and out of the ring for it to work." And that's what kind of what was missing because Jimmy, you know, on the plane, um, I mean, it's not not that big a deal, but I mean, just some, simple things like, you know, not wearing any socks and take, you take off your shoes right yeah, away, on yeah. the plane, and and all of a sudden you notice this odor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm just saying. Inconsiderate. Yeah, inconsiderate. Yeah. And, and but he was, we were just two different people, and and, and uh, you know that was that was kind of what it was. And then uh, I I just started writing by myself, and he and uh, Tataka started writing and having fun and doing things, and, and that just kind of went from there because I. Uh, now it's it's funny you you mentioned Tataka. Now, 
a little fast forward to 95, this is where I meet you. I, I'm yearing, right? I'm a, hot, a skinny kid, green is dog shit. Is that 95? 95, yeah. And it's um, a weekend where you, Jimmy, and Jeff Jarrett are sent to Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling for uh, Indie Weekend, even though right. you guys are... Now, so I, my job is to pick you guys up, drive you around, not say a word, and stuff like that. The moment I picked you up, you were cool as shit. Um, you know, just talking to me like, you know, here I'd watch you on TV and magazines and videos and stuff like that. Here you're talking to me like veteran to a young boy. And it was, it was just so cool. And uh, now, but this is also the weekend. I, I, I don't know if you remember this or something. Like you get a page from your brother to call the office right away. Okay. But you know, you had, you, we had gone out drinking. You had said, that Delray did something. I just know. I just know it's bad on us. And, yeah. And you were worried that, I guess it was him and Tatanka got into something. And uh, you were worried that it was going to come down on you, even though you knew you had nothing. Right. Yeah. Do, do you remember what it is? Or you know what? Well, um. Just something they shouldn't have been doing? Well, probably. I, yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah. I think so. I think that's something that probably, um, see. Then, well, I think you know what it is. I'll talk I'll Okay, ask yeah. You yeah. I'll I, ask you after. Yeah. Think, I man. Think, I mean, yeah. you know, and, and, and we all do stupid shit. Yeah. Man. I mean, I'm, I'm as guilty as the next guy. But, yeah. You know, and, and, and I think that that's part of the reason why I understood if I was going to be out of control. Yeah. Um, I didn't need to be pilled up and in the bar. Right. You could do uh, it in your room. In my room. Yep. Uh, and that's what I tried to do. And it didn't always happen that way, but that's what I tried nine times out of ten to do. So it wasn't reflecting on Bruce. It wasn't reflecting on me. It wasn't reflecting on Jimmy or anything else. And, and there's, you know, things that we've all done that just mm -hmm. we shouldn't have done. Now, when this happens, like, and, and you got to call Bruce. Bruce knows that, you know, hey, man. So the hammer's going to come down. Like, did that cause any like animosity with you and Bruce, or did you know it was just a, like a, I mean, like I, I know the natural thing I would say is, hey man, try and save my job. I'm not the I'm not the fuck up here. Well, but or but did he say ah, it's a business thing? You know what? Maybe I can, if I take it, they'll bring me back. No, I think I think it's just I think I've I've caused my problems and my animosity with Bruce is because of me. What yeah. I, so I mean. Uh, and I've done some things. I've done a lot of things that's caused animosity with, with a few people. And I, it's my fault. I take full responsibility for it. Um, but it wasn't something that... It wasn't something I was going to grovel for my job. It was. I, I've always been that kind of guy. If, look, if you call me on something, I'm going to call him. I'm yeah. going to say, yeah, man, I, I did. I've, I've done it. I accept it. It's just like... Well, what? Just, just a piece of advice. Never let your new boss know that you think he's an asshole. That's just not a good thing to do. But um, you know, I knew when the when I knew when shit went down, if it was going to be asked or if I had to answer to it, I was going to answer to it. And I've and I, it's I've caused it's because of me that, that I'm in the bottom end. Yeah, it's nobody else's fault. And. Uh, that's why I was like kind of being alone and being by myself so I don't have to answer to anybody else's shit. You know, if I had a partner and, and Stan and I went out a few times. We had a great time, no problems. Mm -hmm. We knew what we were doing and uh, we didn't know, I'm not saying we knew what we were doing. We just knew that these were the perimeters we were going to cross. Yeah. I went out with Jimmy a few times and we just understood that he likes doing this, I like doing this. They don't meet. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, no, when, when that happened, if it's what I think it is, um, I mean, I wasn't there. Right. So, I, I had, I mean, and that's why I went, <laughs> thank God. Uh, so, I had nothing that I could really say about it. Yeah. But there were enough people who were that did. Now, uh, this is also the weekend, when we talked about it off, uh, off of a little bit, where Jeff Jarrett's the Intercontinental Champion at the mm -hmm. time. This is uh, July of 1995. Um, you got you guys are doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday for Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling. Sunday's the pay per view, in uh, for in your house where he's going to wrestle Shawn Michaels, and where this, this is Nashville, right? I want to say it was Nashville, Nashville yeah, because yeah. yeah. they, they they have that amazing amazing match. But Friday night in the bar, Jeff who mm. is drinking a lot is telling us, and here I am like twenty two year old kid just just. Shit my pants because he's crying his eyes out about I'm quitting. Sunday's my last match. I'm quitting. You're don't be stupid. 
Yeah, you know, yeah, you you kept calling him Double Jeff. All right, Double Jeff, you stop being a baby. You know, you go in there, you're gonna have a great match. Oh no, no, I'm done, I'm done. Me and me and Road Dog are walking out. You're like, you're not. You know, next Monday I read Jared quits. I'm like, wow, we were there for it. Yeah. But yeah, you spent all weekend trying to talk him out of it. Well, you know what, and and I I don't remember that specifically because yeah. I might have had a few libations. Oh yeah, we maybe were. one or two. Maybe three or four. Coronas. Seven, that was the first time I drank Corona. Too. Jake, you don't like Coronas? I'm just saying. Look, it's like, just, we're going to have problems. I know. It's hilarious too. We have to switch matches tonight. Who you yeah, got tonight? Right now it's going to be you and me. I don't matter. Oh, I'll do, I'll do you. That's cool. Yeah. Anyway. No, I, look, man. I mean, yeah. it, a lot of things were going on back then. It, it was it with... It was, a, it was a weird it weekend. Was a, it was a weird weekend. It was a weird time. I do remember the time period. Yep. And I do remember being up there that weekend, man. And I, and I remember sitting in the bar with you. And I do remember, you know, talking about driving a milk truck and I want to wrestle. And I, yeah. and I, and I just remember understanding that feeling. So I never really wanted to discourage anybody the way I was. No, you were, you were, if anything, you were more of such a push of, you know, you, you need to get bigger and go to Memphis and learn how to work, right. you know. and. Yeah, right. eventually did before they closed. But yeah, yeah I was all I was all you. No, you give it well, me a number. And you're like, don't call Jerry or don't call uh, the Memphis office until you really know you're ready. There you go. And I remember I waited over a year. Cool. Yeah, yeah but that's that's what I always wanted to do. But during those times, you you have to know that there's going to be those times. Yeah. And and I was I've been through a few of them already. So I I'm sure I did talk to Jeff about. It. I I do remember the time that he uh, before he had to put over China. Yeah. Uh, or he it was did China, over, right? Yeah. yeah, I just remember that in catering, and I remember waiting for, you know, him to get his what well, hadn't wasn't going to be a check; it was going to be cash. Wow. Yeah. Now, what was it? Was it was he holding up? Was he holding Vince up, or was it? Look, I know I'm going to eventually get this money in merch, salary, blah blah blah. You I, I don't. I don't know if it was necessarily holding Vince up, and I don't know what was going through Jeff's head necessarily. But I, but I do know that I don't feel Jeff felt he was being treated the way he should have been treated. And, and right or wrong, that's just how he felt. So uh, I think he wanted to make sure that uh, there was not going to be a cancellation of the check. Yeah. There wasn't going to be so I mean, you can't cancel cash, and you just want to make sure you had it in his hand. I, you know, it's been a long time, but I just remember the animosity and the tension at the time. And... Uh, you know, I always liked Jeff. I, I, I always under I understood Jeff was in a tight spot. Being the promoter's son and being in Memphis, especially when everybody's starving and you're driving a new car, doesn't mm -hmm. always get over. In fact, it never gets over. So, uh, but, you know, Jeff had to take care of Jeff. And if you're a smart businessman, that's what you do. You take care of yourself. And that's what I think he was and doing. And something that Vince never forgot. You know, like when, no. he, when he had bought WCW, do you remember the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, he, 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 sing, he singled Jared out on TV. Yeah, and, uh, and, and once again, that's, that's just Vince part of business. And, and I have... Uh, I understand that, but you never say never in this business. Yeah. That's the whole thing. You can never say never. So you're gone for a while, and how does the, the Body Donnas thing come up? Because that's a whole new... No, but I mean, here you are, Dr. Tom, long hair for so long... And all of a sudden, you're back. Zip? Zip is that? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, like, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Either or. But no, the way that came about was uh, things happened, and uh, I said, look, man, if there's anything or any way I could just do anything, man, I'd be more than happy to do it. Just anything. 30 minutes later, hey, how about cutting your hair, dyeing it blonde? You want to be about a donut? No, I don't. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Click. Right. Uh, shit. I just thought about it. Yeah, great, no problem. Thinking again. Now, did you think it was a rib at yeah. first? Did yeah, you? okay. Uh, you know, I thought, yeah, you, because this is your way of showing me I'm the boss, and this is what we're going to do. And I thought, no, 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 I can't, I can't do that, man. Come on, right? We can do something else, can't we? Well, no. Click. Hmm. Okay, great. Still thinking the whole time, maybe I can get out of it, maybe I can come up with something else. But the this vibe. Is the first marriage thing again. Exactly. <laughs> but, 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 the, but the vibe going into it, man, was uh, it was a weird vibe all the way around when, 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 a, lot, when a lot of the stuff went down. And uh, we got to Hershey, Pennsylvania, and 
they filmed this thing of me going to get my haircut. And for whatever reason, you know, they film it, and, and I'm still thinking, there's something more here, man. And right or wrong, again, you know, Tammy and Chris, I love loved them both at the time. Uh, I love Chris more. <laughs> to be honest with you, he's a great guy, always was. Um, but Tammy was Tammy, and Tammy will always be Tammy. Yeah. That's, that's all I can say. So I, I, I'm, I'm going through with it. We take, we get the haircut, and I'm going, oh, my God, man, I'm actually doing this. And it was more to me, I felt at the time, again, right or wrong, that somebody is showing me, I have you right here. And you either do this or, yeah, that's what it was. I had nowhere else to go, man. And uh, I hated the gimmick, hated the name, hated everything about it. I was, it was so because I, constricting, but you know, your hair was like a shield and you could hide and you could, it was something, you know, to play with and it was just something to do and it just had, if you wanted to hide, you didn't have to look at people and just like, had your head down and now I have a crew cut and mm -hmm. you can see everything and I'm like, oh my God. And I never felt comfortable in the gimmick, and I'll never forget the time Vince took us again in Madison Square Garden. I hate to say it, but I'm going to have to say it because I'll, it was in his office in in the garden. And he says, "We're taking Sonny away from you. And we're going to give you uh, the transvestite Jimmy Cloudy." Cloud, yeah. Yeah. And what do you guys think? And I'll never forget Chris saying, "I think it's the stupidest idea I've ever fucking heard." And I thought, oh no, because Chris yeah. actually said that. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, he actually said and I'm going, and I just didn't want to get fired. That's when I thought, oh great, we're, we're done. <laughs> but they did it again to show we have the power and we're taking Sonny and going to put you with the transvestite. Now, that's going to get us over? Yeah, fuck you. And Cornette said that for me before, yeah. but no, I'll say it now. Fuck you. That was bullshit. And I still think it's bullshit. But... You know, it took me a while to get to the point where I can say, fuck you, and I think it's bullshit, because it was bullshit. Yeah. And I knew it was bullshit, but I had nothing else going on. So you got to play the game. Yeah, I was trying to play the game, but Chris knew, and I knew, we knew it was bullshit, and putting Jimmy um, shoulders with us was, I like Jimmy, but, yeah. I mean, could you have buried us anymore? Yeah. I'm sure they could have, they really tried and put their heart into it, but... No, it was bullshit. I, I pretty much um, understood that. And then, but later on, when I got the training gig in '96, right. I was school. gonna say, how do you how do you come about with the training gig? Is that something that you you pitch to them, or they say, you know, Dr. Tom, you get a lot of knowledge, you can? No, I I, I was in Houston again on a time off, and uh, went down to Tugboat Taylor School, and there were some guys training, and I happened to show them a few things. Bruce Bruce had come with me. Mm -hmm. I had shown them. Uh, very few things. I don't know, maybe it was just a simple headlock takeover. Hey, try it this way. Hey, slow down just a little bit, something like that. They were looking to do an in-house uh, tr uh, training, in-house talent search, whatever. Before, before This is all before developmental. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, this is the first this, development. Yeah. And uh, Vince was looking at Occam Albrecht. Yeah. You know, they'd already sponsored Mark Henry during the Olympics. He wanted to be a wrestler. And then, uh, of course, Dwayne Johnson was already wrestling in Memphis. He had yeah. already had some matches, but they just want to polish him up for Survivor Series. So Vince called me in his office and said, I understand you have some experienced training people. But yes, I did. So Bruce well, is already Yeah. Tom's trains people. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, great. My my career's coming to an end, man. I'm about like, like it's thirty, about to turn thirty six, man. Um, the my, the bumps are hurting, man. Yeah. I'm not working with anybody. It's it's. I've been through two shit programs. Chris broke his neck. He broke his neck again yeah. in Madison Square Garden, and uh, we, we were going nowhere fast. So I said, yeah, of course, man. I'd love to. And uh, we did it in the training. Uh, started in the studio with yeah. with Dwayne, Ockham, and Mark, and it took off from there. And uh, then we went to, you know, we had Memphis, we had, Brett was also training people in his house, and then Jim Cornette, finally, uh, we convinced Vince to change the rings, too, from those hard-ass... Holy shit, yeah. I remember the first time I, I did oh. jobs up there, that was ridiculous. Yeah, and we, I told him, because I was taking the bumps. Yeah. I was the guy having to show Occam, and I was the guy having to show Mark. 
Dwayne was already known. Dwayne yeah. already knew. And that's why when people say, well, did you train The Rock? I had a hand in training The Rock. I didn't train The Rock. Yeah. It was a natural. He, he grew up in the business. So yeah, I, yeah, but the thing is, I was taking the Mark Henry bumps. I was taking the Occam bumps. So when they go on the road, I would work with them under the mask. Dr. X, right? Yeah, Dr. X. Of course. Yeah. Why, not, why not as Dr. Tom? Um, I don't, don't know. Don't you think they would have like it would have been better for them to beat you as a name value as a, as opposed to? <laughs> oh yeah, I was a name guy. Yeah, no, I, I don't really think they thought I was a name guy. Really, okay. I don't believe they ever thought of me anything more than what they think of me. Training, now. yeah, training, and even that. So I mean, but I was taking. I told them, said, look, man, because I was, we were in there every single day, mm -hmm. and it was getting hurting because Occam, I love the guy, but he was just. Really brutal, and uh, we're trying yeah, to tell the retard strength. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, exactly. And uh, so, anyway, Cornette and I we were the ones who actually, Jimmy more so. Uh, I was the one who first mentioned it, saying, "Look, these guys are killing me." And, we, and there was a new style coming in too. You know, I'm in mean, the flying and flipping more and bumps. All that stuff. more mm -hmm. bumps, and so we finally got him to uh, build the new rings, and that's how that got changed too. So everybody taking bumps now can thank. Myself and Jim Cornette. Don't don't leave Jim out of that because Cornette has a lot to do with it too. Now, um, Dory Funk comes in and does the the Funk and Dojo. This is where we meet again in, right. in 1998. Right. Yeah. So now you're you know the trainer and stuff like that. It was it was cool to see it come full full circle. Now, um, as we wrap up and stuff like that, how do you want to be remembered? You know what? Honestly, I, I'm just. I would be glad to be remembered uh, as helping as many people as possible, honest to goodness, because I know what I did, especially in developmental. As a wrestler, I was just happy to be a wrestler. Honest to goodness, man, I, I was happy to be in this business. I'm still in this business. I'll be in this business the rest of my life. Yeah. No matter what we do, we're it's, always going to be... It's a life sentence. Yeah, yeah, exactly, it is. So I would just like, at least for the guys that I helped, and, and they know who they are, and by helping, they also know what I mean. Uh, I'm not just talking about showing you a wrist lock. Life. I'm talking about as you're teaching someone, you need to have their trust and their confidence if they have issues. Because we're all human beings and we all have issues that sometimes will affect us professionally as well. Right. So you need to have someone that you can go to in confidence, if need be, to help you settle your issues. I hope that if I was able to do that, great. Um, you know, not always does it turn out the way you want it to, but at the same time, uh, I would hope that the guys would remember that I at least cared and gave a shit. Yeah. Um, if you were salv salvageable, I hope I, we, that we salvaged you. I hope that we helped. I helped. Yeah. Um, and I had some great times, man, so I, I, I would just like... Uh, I don't know if there's anything else to be remembered for except just uh, that I did give a shit about my job and I cared about people that came through there. And I still care about the people that go through there because I don't want it to go away. If you gave us $3 million, we could have built a great system and a great building, but you know what? It wasn't that time. So. Greatest wrestler you were in the ring with? Wow. I don't know, man. Um, I don't know, I, I, the greatest wrestler ever. I know that light's blinking, but does that mean anything? Well, oh, he's, I'm fighting him. Yeah. That's all you, you have two more I, minutes and you, you know what? You know what? The, great, uh, the greatest wrestler, I've wrestled a lot of, I, I've wrestled Kurt Angle. I mean, you know, he's, he's a great wrestler. I, I mean, I've wrestled a lot of great guys. I just don't know uh, if I can single anybody out, man. It was, uh, I had some really good, uh, Dirty White Boy, Jeff, I mean, I was going to say, did you have a favorite that I, you liked to work with? Uh, Dirty White Boy, we had a chemistry. Jeff Jarrett yeah. I had a chemistry with, man. It was like, um, you know, some people, you just go in the ring, you don't have to say a word, you just know, just flows. Go. Yeah. I mean, a lot of great guys. I can't think right off the top of my head. Well, I'd like to thank you for doing this. No, this I'd like was to thank fun. You. It was a great to listen. You know, I, I love listening to, you know, stories and how, you know, guys' road is, you know, everybody's road is paved different, but we all, yeah. we're all, we all meet at one point. It's, it, it's absolutely amazing. Well, I, I listen, I really, I, I thank you for, uh, for doing it as well. I just, uh, I have one issue I, I've got to get off my chest, and it's going to be that guy right after this, man, I promise you. So. Thank you guys. This is Old much. School uh, Steve Carino, Dr. Tom Pritchard, and the, Soon to be deceased, Jake Manny. Until next time.
Pritchard having a little bit of fun with this crowd here in South Carolina. Uh, about ready to wait for the inches of his opponent, Steve Carino. Uh, most of you people that are probably seeing this match right now have purchased the old school interview series with, hosted by Steve Carino and his guest being Tom Pritchard. Now something and might have happened song. between the time of the interview happening that these men are now about to come to blows. He weighs in at 244 pounds. The King of Steve Carino kind of slapping hands in the unfamiliar role of babyface here. Both men are known rule breakers, so Zane Riley's going to have his hands full in this contest. Both men getting set. Steve Carino taking off the jacket, taking it off promptly in non-George South fashion. Once again, folks, just want to remind you that we're here in Dorton High School in Roebuck, South Carolina, just outside of Spartanburg, South Carolina. This is Jake Manning sitting in in the commentary booth. Very uh, unusual position for me. Uh, much like uh, refereeing is an unusual position for Zane Riley and Steve Carino. And Steve Carino, fan favorite, also an unusual position. So all the way around, kind of an unusual position for everybody involved, except for Dr. Tom Pritchard. No stranger to the squared circle. The lockup back in the corner. Zane Riley getting in between these two men, asking for a break. Clean break between both men. Like I said, we got to watch out for both competitors here. They're quite the rule breakers. But I'll tell you this, uh, Steve Carino, uh, seems to be in a pretty good mood. Not in a grouchy mood like he mostly is. Tom Pritchard, nice headlock takeover. Steve Crino, nice reversal. Quick reversal by Steve. Both men back up. Hey man, we could see a lot of stalemates in this. Like I said, they were both veterans of the rings, ring, uh, rings that is. I was gonna say squirt circle again, but I messed up. I'm not that great of a commentator here. I'm no Dr. Tom Pritchard or Steve Carino. I'm sure I'll get notes from both gentlemen. I'm sure Tom Pritchard will, will definitely uh, uh, let me know that I didn't do a good job, much like he did in the interview about me filming and stuff like that. Like I said, I hope, thank you for your purchase of that. This is just bonus material for you folks. Right now, Tom Pritchard's kind of got a bonus of an arm bar. Steve Grill gets a bonus arm drag out of it. Both men are back up. Like I said, don't. Don't be surprised if we see one or two stalemates here like we are right now. Tom Pritchard taking a knee, though. Zane Riley asking for a little bit of action. Steve Carino listening to the cheer of those fans. Asking to, some little kid asked him to punch Tom Pritchard in the face. Whoa, both men might go to blows here. Both men are not afraid of that, I can tell you that much. We're going back to wrestling. Oh, Dr. Tom goes low for a leg dive. Steve a little slow to get down, but Steve, Steve quickly out and into a hammerlock. Excellent wrestling maneuver. Backing away, Steve Carino, clean break. Fiery baby faces Steve Carino this evening. Oh, they're asking a ref. Oh, Steve Carino's heard this one before. Steve Carino has tried this one before. On me, nonetheless. And the people who know me, Bad Scout Jake Manning, Google me, and you'll realize how ridiculous that is. Now 
the lockup by both men. Tom Pritchard quick to a top wrist lock, very quick to a top wrist lock. So Steve gets a reversal out of this. He's back down to a knee right now. Zane Riley just checking on Steve, see how he's doing. I think we're going to be settling in for quite the long contest between these two men. I have noticed several uh, several of the people on the undercard coming out. This is kind of what you would say, a curtain sellout. I'm seeing people like uh, Cedric Alexander, Caleb Conley coming out and kind of listen, watching these veterans and see what they do. Tom Pritchard in control. Steve's got to watch out for that... Uh, for that shoulder, the back up. Oh, Steve's hot. Steve is hot. Come a little bit of pull the hair. I'll tell you one thing that uh, the Tom Pritchard's doing right now is being evasive right now. But one person that's not being evasive right now is Cedric Alexander. Cedric Alexander, like I was saying before, kind of a curtain sellout right now. And in, in that with a lot of young talent right now is watching this match between these two veterans. Nah. Oh. Ah. Oh. First of all, hello, Jake Manning. How are you doing, sir? Good, you're good. Yeah, it was interesting. But yes. Well, this well, contest between Tom Pritchard and Steve Carino right now. This is Wrestling School 101. Exactly. That's exactly right. Like, so the, most people that are watching this are probably seeing this as bonus material on the old school interview series that is hosted by Steve Carino uh, with an interview with Tom Pritchard. Well, this, mm -hmm. this will go on in the DVD and such. Mm -hmm. So this is quite a nice compliment and stuff like that. Um, so like I said, you're going to see both these men going at it. There's something must have happened between the time we filmed the interview and now, and it's a little bit of heated between these two men. I thought they were on the same page. We're a little mad at each other. Dr. Tom taking some uh, shortcuts right now. And he's, he's arguing with Zane Riley, like I said, in the unfamiliar position of referee. Steve Carino in the unfamiliar position of the fiery young baby face here. <laughs> fiery young baby face. He's ready to get into Tom Pritchard. Be careful of your words right there. Oh, that, yeah, that, that, that did sound that, bad. That sounded that real sound bad. bad. It so, did. But I appreciate you <laughs> making me feel much better of my commentating out here. But the, I'll tell you one I'm here to make you look good, brother. I, I, I appreciate that. But one person that's not looking good right now is Steve Credo, who is stuck in a headlock right now by Tom Pritchard. Shoots him off. Big shoulder tackle by Tom Pritchard. On the move. Drop down. Oh. Steve Credo, big hip lock. Looking for a big arm drag. You know, that's one maneuver that Steve always says. He goes, typically, you will not see me do an arm drag. When you see me do an arm drag, don't, don't blink, because you might think you're seeing Steam, Ricky Steamboat. I'm not going to lie. When he did it, I thought Ricky Steamboat. He's, he's it was a, very good. Steve yeah. Carino is one heck of an arm dragger. I think Steve Carino does not give himself enough credit for these arm drags. They're amazing. Oh, no, he gives himself more than enough More than enough. Oh, He'll okay. let you know. He'll let you know. But I mean, rightfully so. They're great arm drags. But it looks like he's getting ready to give Dom, Tom Pritchard a good old knee to the arm. Picking apart the arm right now, Steve Carino. Being very scientific it. about it. Dr. Tom Pritchard has trained the stars of the future, and I'm sure he's taught many, many a WWE superstars about taking a body part, working it over, working it over slowly, or very fastly. I know there's not a lot of time to wrestle on TV. No, no, no. I, but <laughs> but I, I'm sure he's he's more shown the, the best way to do damage to a body part, that is for sure. And right now, Steve Carino got control of that arm. He is not letting go. Tom Pritchard trying to get away. Let's see what type of dirty oh. trick he's got, and it's just a kick to the stomach. Straight forward and to the point. And so is this turnbuckle in the corner. Tom Pritchard's in control of this matchup right now. Let's see if Steve can kind of turn it around. Blocks it. Tom Pritchard eats it in the buckle. That's right, here we go. No, another one right That's here. That's two. That's two. We're probably going to see three coming up right here, folks. Are we going to see a four, Cedric? Look at Steve Carino getting fired up. Crowd getting behind him. They want to see that fourth turnbuckle, Cedric. Oh, the and board. we got four. Tom's down. He's down. He's down. Oh. Barely a two count. Zane Riley said a two, but he kicked out well before two. And Tom Pritchard is out of the ring. Looks like he's taking the walk back to locker room, but he's going on the wrong end of the building. A little discombobulated right there. But still smart enough to catch his breath, you know. Well, he, Catch his composure. He, much like what you did with Donnie Dollars earlier, in the sense that to Tom Pritchard is making Steve Carino wrestle his type of match. He's slowing the pace down. He wants a Steve to wrestle his way, not to wrestle Steve's way. 
I mean, Tom Pritchard is, is not called uh, Dr. Tom Pritchard <laughs> for, for, for going to medical school for two years and then dropping out. So the, man, the man is well versed in, in the doctorage of wrestling. He knows what he's doing. He has his, he has it together. And, and right now he's letting Zane Riley. He better get it together as a referee. Although Zane's doing an excellent job here tonight, he was put in a compromising situation. Well, back to lockup by both men. Trying to kind of get a break, but no man wants a break. Pull that, pulling the hair a little bit is Dr. Uh, Tom. But he knows all the dirty tricks. That's uh. why Dr. Tom did it. Tom got him in the corner again, goes low again. Knows that belly's soft on Carino, kind of working it over a little bit. Now he's got a snap mare into a chin lock here. Good old fashioned chin lock. Taking him down to the mat. Steve Carino trying to get out. Quick he, oh. again. Like I said, Steve, quick to get out of it. And Steve back in control. Okay. He's going to work on that arm some more. Yep. But hang in hold of it, as opposed to most, most of you young guys now. You'll, yeah. you'll do that move and you'll we walk do. away. But Steve got kept control of that arm. But as a smart ring veteran, Tom Pritchard got a little bit of space and got away. And now he's on the outside. Oh, but now he's in control of Steve. Hangs him by the throat. And now he can take his time a little bit. And so it's almost like a little bit of uh, setting him up for it. He goes out. Steve thought he was just going to go out to complain. But really, what he did is he set him up for a little hangman over there on the rope. And now this is just, you know, tubing and steel that he just struck Steve Carino's throat over. I think he might have to give Ring Honor a call and say he can't commentate for him <laughs> sometime soon because his larynx is hurt, courtesy of Dr. Tom Pritchard. Well, I don't maybe, think maybe, he's... Maybe, maybe that's what the whole issue is over. Maybe Dr. Tom wants to do some commentating for Ring of Honor here. And that's why he's so frustrated right here. Like I said, we filmed the, the old school interview hosted by Steve Carino with Tom Pritchard, which most of most you people have seen. And we thank you for that purchase once again for the third time on the, in this match. But as, like I said, something must have happened. I think Tom probably found out that Steve is doing commentary for Ring of Honor, your home federation right now. As of right now. Yeah. As, as yeah. of right now. Um, I'm sure he's. That may change it. tomorrow. We don't know. We don't know. But you know, like I said, maybe uh, Tom's trying to get in on that Ring of Honor paycheck money. Look, it's, it's been doing well for Steve. Yeah. Doing well for Steve right now. Steve, but Steve really needs to be doing well for himself right now and finding a way out of this this uh, hold right here, which I believe is a cravat right it is, now. It is a cravat. Which we saw in the first contest with Caleb Conley. Dr. Tom wrenching it hard. We don't see a lot of cravats, but we saw two of them no. here tonight. It's one of those moves that it comes around once in a blue moon. And, and, and Tom Pritchard is using it to its full potential. I think Caleb Connolly had it, but he did not use it to the full potential like Dr. Tom is. He is really wrenching in you know, on Steve Carino. Getting so much leverage on that neck. Yes, exactly. Dynamite drop-in said it. This correspondence class is really starting to pay off. I'm, I'm, I'm work it's, it's a work in progress, brother. Those elbows to the back of the neck, not helping him at all. Is that I know where this body's like. Oh! Wake okay, back, big elbow. Telegraphed it a little bit too much there, Cedric. And so did oh. Steve Carino. And now Tom Pritchard back in control. Smartly goes straight for the pin and gets a two count. And right back to that chin lock, staying on top of the man. Exactly. He's been working over his neck the whole time. He's just staying on it. That, that's the type of technician that Tom Pritchard is. Like I said, finding that body part, working it over, taking his time, needling it over. He knows that if Steve Carino's neck is hurting, he might not be able to execute all the maneuvers he wants to maneuver. Now it's like he's going from the neck to the to the shoulder blades. Oh, that's, that's even still the upper part of the neck and stuff like that. Trust me, when you get older, <laughs> I, if, if Tom Pritchard did that maneuver to me right now, I would be screaming, I may tap out. You may. I'm a little surprised that Steve was able to withstand that type of punishment, especially after that big, vicious cravat he was put into a little bit earlier. Yeah, but Steve has been through God knows how many hardcore matches and been through so many different things in his life. I'm, I'm sure he's able to take this. And that's true, and all the punishment that he, he uh, probably withstained during his time in Zero One. You yeah. see people like Hashimoto, uh, Otani, and, and various other people like that. Very tough individuals that he faced over there in, in Japan. He's literally been in the ring with some of the hardest hitters in the world. And the most unsafe hitters in the world most, as well. Oh. <laughs> I won't say it to their face, but I'm sure you can. Don't worry, I don't, I don't think Balls Mahoney can swing a chair like he used to. <laughs> we'll have to have Steve let us know one of these days. 
But right now, I think he's trying to find a way out of uh, Tom Pritchard right now. Seems As like. I, I think he's uh, almost hoping he'd be in the ring with Balls Mahoney right now, the way that Tom Pritchard's been putting the hurt on him right now. Balls Mahoney ain't going to put a hold on like that, brother. You're not going to put a hold well, on like that. Well, he's going to hit him with a chair and then walk away, where Tom Pritchard's going to stay on him and just be a tactician. Like Steve. I said, I think maybe he's hurting his neck. Maybe he's thinking if Steve is in a neck brace, then maybe Sinclair Broadcasting won't fly him in to do commentary. Oh, but Jawjacker. Steve Crean will try to get fired up. Look, look at that fist pump. Look, look at, He's getting it. Looking for the approval of this crowd. This kid's kind of getting behind a little bit. Tom Pritchard trying to stop all that nonsense. With a straight foot to the back. Taking Steve back down. And the knee driven right into the back right there. Maybe you got a few of those short ribs back there. People they discredit a good blow to the short ribs. How quickly that can stop a man. Mm. You know, those floating ribs that kind of sit around there. You know, you get a backbreaker a little bit higher up in one way or another, start hurting those short ribs, and all of a sudden breathing gets pretty hard all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So you got to watch that, because like I said, Tom Pritchard, quite the tactician, looked like he's going for Steve Carino's ear, trying to give him a little cauliflower ear there. More Ripping like, and tearing into him. Yeah, you kind of induct him into Cauliflower Alley right there with a <laughs> the Cauliflower ear. Big vertical suplex by Tom Pritchard. Got Steve Carino up with Dr. ease. Tom. I think Dr. Tom's been hitting the gym there. Just a two count, but I wouldn't have been surprised there with a three count. Now, Donnie Dollar's giving you a vertical suplex and going for a, going for a count. Uh, I thought it was a little... Um, premature of him. I felt like he should have hit a bigger maneuver on you. But I'll tell you what, with the veracity that Tom Pritchard uh, enacted that vertical suplex, I can believe that he could have got a three count uh, probably seven days out of the week. Definitely. Steve Carino. But, fair, but unfortunately, Steve Carino works eight days out of the week, <laughs> especially when it comes to wrestling. And once again, like I said, that, that, that backbreaker. Breaker. Oh, very close. Very close kick out right there. Very close kick out. Steve Carino pumping the fist, trying to get the people behind him, trying to feed off this energy. And right now, Tom Pritchard ain't having none of that. Nope, just trying to slow it down. Have Steve Carino wrestle his type of match. Like I said, I, I think Tom Pritchard is going for a full um, spinal column workover right now. <laughs> He's going from the lower to the mid and stuff like that. Like I said, if Tom Pritchard was doing all this to me, and I'm sure he would love to do all this to me, <laughs> if you've seen the interview that he conducted earlier with Steve Carino, old school edition, um, he would love to, to do, work, do a number on my spinal column. And like I said, I'd, I'd tap out the way my spinal column feels right now. <laughs> Steve Carino may, may not get a chance to give up. Like he's fading. It looks like Zane Riley may drop his oh. hand down for a third time, but no, it's up. There's still blood flowing. There's still something going. He's still got his wits about him. These people starting to get behind him. He's he's working up to his feet now. Working his way up. Tom Pritchard still on him, though, not letting go of the hold. Swinging. Swinging at that gut. Steve, Steve Carino's trying to fight his way out, get a little bit of distance. Tom Pritchard is just right on him. I think that's what you see a lot of these, these veterans. They're staying right on their competitor. Anytime that some of their working over get a little bit of space, a little bit of time, gives them time to recuperate. Over the suplex, got caught. And gets caught with a three count. Small package out of nowhere, Steve Carino. He just needed a little bit of time, just a little bit of space to get the three count on Dr. Tom Pritchard. The half second that Tom Pritchard took to set up that suplex was all Steve Carino needed to get that three count. Like I said, he needs space, creates opportunity. Steve Carino, being the veteran that he is, like you said, only needed a half a second to capitalize and get a victory over Dr. Tom Pritchard. Congratulations, Steve Carino. Does this mean we got to call him Dr. Steve Carino now? I think we should. I think we should. He definitely has the doctor glasses. I'll say that much. He yeah, but I'd be afraid I walked in the doctor's office and saw Steve Carino staring at me. That, that, that might scare me a little. Just a little. Check your bum. Don't worry. <laughs> I know, I know. I thought you were driving. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
want your number, I want your zip code, I want your address, I'm suing you, and I'm filing a major complaint with Sam Munchnick as well as Bob Geigel on you. It looks like Dr. Tom was another round. Looks like Dr. Tom is not finished with like, Steve Carino. He feels like he, he wants a mulligan on that whole match. Dr. Tom calling shenanigans. Big body, body slam. slam. Schoolboy. Schoolboy. One, two. He beat him again. And there's another three count. That's two in a row. Steve Carino is. <laughs> so wait, do we call him Dr. Two Carino? I don't know. I think we call him winner. I think we call uh, him a double winner. Du right now, if, if this is a best of seven series. So he has a double Dr. doctor right now? Dr. Tom is about halfway away from elimination. Dr. Tom still don't look happy. Yeah, he may grab the microphone and challenge him again. I don't know. Who knows? I thought these men were going to go all night. He might and challenge you now. He <laughs> might. He definitely put the verbal beat down on me. He wasn't looking at me. He was looking at you. No, he was definitely looking definitely at me. Definitely looking at you. Okay. We had words earlier during the taping of Steve Carino's old school with Dr. Tom Pritchard, which I, for once again, thank you for the purchase because most of you are probably seeing this, Matt, or seeing this as a bonus. It looks like Dr. Tom is asking for the microphone again. Five, five, five. You want to go that way? Okay. Give me one more chance. One more chance. Oh, oh, oh. Best of five, folks. Best of five. Oh. Oh. This is the biggest bunch of bull I've ever heard. Bring that belt one more time. Give it to me. Are we doing this the third time? Dr. Tom goes low on him again. Whip to the corner. Charge it in. Steve Carino. Sunset flip. He got him. We got him. One, two, three. Beat him again. Steve Carino is elated, and that he should be. That he should be. He beat the doctor three times in a row. <laughs> I think he's done now. Yeah, he's done. He's walking to the back. Okay. Looks like Dr. Tom has had enough. He's ready to turn in his doctor license. But most importantly, I think he's going to investigate the legitimacy of Zane Riley's referee license before that happens. There may be a further review on that. But I, all those three counts look clean, look accurate, look crisp and sharp. The cadence was perfect for me. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing, Steve Carino, who, who is a little boy, a little wrestling fan inside of him, most certainly will agree with all those three counts as well, folks. So, hope you enjoyed Steve Carino versus Dr. Tom Bridge. I like King Kong Bundy stuff there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember this. I was a young boy at the time. In the bar where? Huh? In the bar? No. Oh. We, um, you, Del Rey, and Jeff Jarrett were uh, wrestling in Pennsylvania. Right. First time we met, I drove you guys around. Right. 
and it was the time uh, uh, I think it was the weekend that you got you guys got your notice because Del Rey got into something yeah. and Jeff ended up quitting that weekend remember like I don't know if you remember this before we go on yeah. we were drunk we were we were drinking at a bar with him and he was going nuts about how he wanted to quit and you were like don't be stupid you know this you were, Jeff or Del Rey? Jeff. Oh, De Jeff yeah you had already known something was going to happen like I guess your uh, brother had paged you like no I don't know I, but I'll tell you what happened but go ahead. yeah but and then Jeff was telling us at the bar on on the Friday night it was a Thursday Friday Saturday loop right. and then Sunday you guys had in your house and he worked Sean on the pay-per-view right. and that's where him and Road Dog quit but he was telling us that Friday like you know, the more you drag, I quit, I'm leaving, I'm quitting. You're like, don't be stupid. Like, yeah. you were trying to talk him out of it. And the next thing you know, like, he quit. But, but yeah, I think there were some other issues going on in there, man, because um, they let his contract go. Right, yeah. And that's what it was. And I remember that. I remember very clearly when he did quit. I see the red light on, but I don't give a fuck. That um, he actually made... A certain someone, you'll get two hundred grand in cash. Now was that was that for that time or was that the time he had when he put over China or was that? Oh, that was a China. Yeah, deal. this oh, one. Oh, I'm sorry, that was this, the other deal. That, yeah, oh, you're right. Maybe it was. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't remember that because I, I was probably way intoxicated. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. chances are. But uh, yeah, it was the first time Wait, I ever somebody, had to meet. What do you mean, definitely? Oh, I no, no, you were pretty hammered, but you were like the voice of reason. Because Del Rey was out of hand. Jeff was out of hand. I was well, just young guy. Well, Jimmy's been out of hand. Yeah. Yes, that is true. Yeah, and you're just, no, don't quit. I don't like that you wearing headsets, Jake, because you were here. Everything you're eavesdropping. You know, I want you to know something. Our commentary at Charlotte literally sucked balls. But I'll tell you this right now. I enjoyed every friggin' second of it. I mean, God. Yeah, it's hard to commentate, you know what I mean? And, and I'm, I'm used to commentating now for Ring of Honor. I mean, I find it, you, you're supposed to call falls, near mm -hmm. falls, all that other stuff. You're supposed to do certain things that, that you're taught in, in some places to do. And I'm sitting there, I'm trying to call this shit, and I don't know half the, the shit that I'm calling. I don't really know what, what the moves are called, which I'm, I hate to admit, but I really don't. Anyway, we, we, we can start any time. Yeah, I'm just, go right ahead. You can start right now. You start like don't this. tell me how to live my life. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Sorry? My life is one that has to be.